Good morning. My name is John Herbst, and I run the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. Um, thank you all for coming today. And I'd like to thank most of all um, Chairman Cardin of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee for helping us um, arrange this room <coughs> for today's event. And I'd like to thank also um, Daniel Gottfried, who is a guy for who, for Senator Cardin, got this done. So thank you very much, Daniel. All right. Uh, this is a really uh, interesting event. Uh, we have, uh, we, the Atlantic Council in this case, have 10 partners from the think tank community who've co-sponsored this. And I remember having the very first conversation about this with my co-conspirator in chief, Alina Polyakova, of SIPA, who was enthusiastic about the idea. And thank you for that, Alina. And um, then with everyone else. Uh, 11 think tanks from across the political, uh, the policy spectrum, from left to right, who understand that we face um, a compelling danger from uh, Putin's Russia, which is not to minimize the greater long-term danger from Xi's China. But Russia is our only peer nuclear competitor, and, and Putin's policies are notably more aggressive than Xi's, although Xi is catching on. So we have decided it's very important to address the Russian challenge directly. Uh, we have some experience with this, as you know. Uh, we had a containment policy after World War II, which lasted until 1990, and the implosion of the Soviet Union. And it's time to dust that off, understand the threat, and put it in place. Now, this idea is not unique to the folks who've organized this panel. Uh, my friend David Kramer wrote an excellent monograph on this several years ago. ago. Uh, Andrew Weiss and Gene Rumer from Carnegie did a superb op-ed in the Wall Street Journal on this in the fall. And um, SIPA, uh, with Alina and Sam Green, have been working on this. And there's a report that we're here for you to receive today with the same theme. So a lot of good work has been done on this. But what we're trying here is to mobilize, again, the think tank community to talk about this problem and how to address it. So I talk longer than I normally do with introductions. And I am now going to turn the floor over um, to Congressman Keating, a long-term congressman from, from Massachusetts. Um, he's one of several members of the House and the Senate who will be with us today, Republican and Democrat. Congressman Keating, over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you, John, and good morning to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. We're here uh, 10 days before the second anniversary uh, Russia's full-scale invasion of Iraq, of Iraq. Uh, a pardon to the president in that, and uh, many of uh, that. Uh, that was a slip. Uh, but we're here just at a short time, and it seems so long since it's been there. 2014 was the first uh, invasion into Crimea, uh, <coughs> illegal and aggressive, and now uh, we're here. It's important to remember that. Uh, most intelligence agencies, including our own, never thought we'd be here talking about uh, this war right now. Uh, and so it's at a critical juncture, uh, and uh, I'm pleased to be here. As John mentioned, uh, I'm the representative from Massachusetts and the ranking member and the previous chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee in Europe. And I'm honored to be part of today's uh, event with Senator Cardin, Representative Turner, Representative Kaptur, all dear friends and allies of Ukraine. I also want to thank the Atlantic Council uh, formally, and I want to thank you again, John, uh, for hosting this event and the many organizations that are participating today. Your work is essential in promoting American values and ideals, uh, defending democracy, formulating policy that will further U.S. leadership, not just now, but for years to come. During my time in Congress, I've seen firsthand 
the persistent spread of Russian malign influence, beginning with the invasion of Georgia in 2008 and continuing with Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea in 2014, through the use of Wagner and other gray zone tactics, uh, Vladimir Putin's imperialistic mindset crescendoed into a brutal, full-scale invasion of Ukraine two years ago that's left thousands dead, displaced, and injured. While the world witnessed the terror of this full-scale invasion and its associated <coughs> war crimes, from missile attacks on maternity wards to the abduction of Ukrainian children, we sometimes overlook the countless hybrid yet equally provocative attacks on the, uh, the U.S. and European allies and partners from Russia, attacks on critical infrastructure and interference in our elections are only part of Moscow's sustained attack on democratic systems which seek to undermine the world's order, which has defined international politics for the last eight decades. As Putin attempts to attack democracies and undermine confidence in our institutions, he's also corrupted Russia's democracy by holding staged elections, eliminating the separation of powers, and demonizing vulnerable populations. He's concurrently cracked down on dissidents at home, imprisoned opposition leaders and journalists. He's assassinated opponents, and most recently, using prisoners as cannon fodder in his unjust war. These actions must not only be defeated on the battlefield of Ukraine, but they must also be contained if we value our democracy. To combat Russia's malign influence abroad and its attacks on democracies around the world, it's our duty as the most powerful nation on earth to lead the transatlantic alliance against Putin and against his war of aggression in Ukraine. Just as the U.S. took a leading role in defeating the Nazis in World War II, we cannot stand by with misguided beliefs that <coughs> Defending democracy abroad is no longer an American interest at home, nor can we fail to honor the sacrifice of those brave Americans who gave their lives to defend democratic freedoms, freedoms that many of us take for granted today. Like so many, my own uncle was killed in action in France in 1944. There were others who took home permanent injuries, hidden wounds, families that were separated during that period. People like my own mother who uh, left her job to work in manufacturing to help the war effort. These are people that created uh, the peace and prosperity we're living with today. And it would be shameful if we failed to support Ukrainians as they valiant, valiantly def defend the Western world order that these brave men and women set the foundation of 80 years ago. In fact, adopting an isolationist stance, one which really cares about what happens within our border only, greatly undermines U.S. leadership in national security. By demonstrating an unwillingness or unease to support our allies, we signal to our adversaries that their hostile action will be met with indifference and inaction. These signals will be heard far beyond Ukraine, as well as in Beijing and Tehran. To rein in and contain Russians' aggression and malign influence campaigns, we must do three things. First, we must provide Ukraine with the aid it desperately needs. This aid must be comprehensive, and it must address Ukraine's most urgent needs, including ammunition and weapon systems, it must also uh, be in concert with the extraordinary courage of the Ukrainian people themselves, who have proven effective against the Russians. <coughs> U.S. assistance to Ukraine not only directly counters Russians, the Russians' aggression, a key U.S. foreign policy goal, but it also ensures Ukrainian soldiers fighting in the ba battlefield have secure and stable families at home. They cannot be asked to take time out of their life the way they have in the battlefield and worry about what's happening to their wives, their children, their fathers, and their mothers at home. And I thank the Senate for showing the leadership and passing a bipartisan bill which not only supports Ukraine and our allies in Israel and the Indo-Pacific. Uh, just five months ago, 
It seems longer than that. But it's important to remember that just five months ago, the House voted by a 311 to 117 vote, overwhelmingly uh, approving additional Ukraine aid. The current Senate packages should not be held hostage because of partisan politics. And that is exactly where we are today. That's exactly why this uh, discussion here today is so important. Second, we must continue to hold Russia and the Kremlin accountable for their unconscionable war crimes. This process begins by calling Russians' invasion what it is, a crime of aggression. I've worked across the aisle on this issue and introduced the resolution <coughs> calling for the president to support the creation of a special tribunal for the punishment of the crime of aggression, something that our European allies have moved forward on in their own regard and something uh, that uh, the Ukrainian officials uh, have said is vital uh, to their effort. As a former prosecutor myself, the U.S. must also work with war crimes investigators to ensure they have the resources they need to interview victims and build cases against the perpetrators of this genocide. The Atrocity Crimes Relief and Accountability Act, which I introduced in the 117th Congress and which passed at the end of 2022, helps accomplish this goal, but there's much more that we have to do. Furthermore, this crime of aggression has targeted not only Ukrainian people, but the land itself. To this end, I've worked closely with Ukrainian prosecutor uh, Andrei Kostin, uh, who's coined Russia's attack as an attack on the environment as well. Financially, uh, the Foreign Affairs Committee has worked across the aisle with the Repo Act to transfer Russian sovereign assets to Ukraine. Going further, I've introduced the bill with Representative Brendan Boyle of Pennsylvania, uh, which passed in a bipartisan manner through the Senate which would expand the authority of the Department of Justice to transfer forfeited Russian assets of individuals and entities who violate sanctions and export controls. Both these bills ensure Russia bears the cost of its imperialistic ambitions and the rehabilitation of Ukraine's territory, uh, ter territorial integrity. Moscow must understand that its actions face grave consequences on the international stage and that they are responsible for the destruction that they have inflicted. The Kremlin must also be held accountable for the use of wrongfully detained Americans as political hostages. Journalist Evan Gershkovitz and former Marine Paul Whelan remain behind bars in Russia, accused and charged of crimes that they did not commit. Additionally, US citizen and journalist, also Kermasheva, remains imprisoned, as well as legal permanent <coughs> residents and opposition leader Vladimir Karamurza, along with thousands more. Russia's crackdown on dissent and free press shines light on Putin's vulnerability and on his weakness, on his fear that the truth about his criminality and corruption threaten his authoritarian power. Finally, we must rein in Russian aggression by creating a new whole of government strategy to combat the combined malign influence of Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea, which the Kremlin has propagated to advance its objectives around the world. Each of these countries, and include therein Belarus, as well as uh, non-state actors like Hezbollah and the Assad regime in Syria, have aided Russia in its wars of aggression, must also be held accountable through the sanctions and, and other measures that we are leader on, that we're leaders on. Furthermore, we must go on the offensive, and this is important, which is why I worked with Senator Sheen and Representative Turner to pass the Black Sea Security Act, which requires the US government to craft a new strategy for engagement in the Black Sea region. It not only advances US interests, but promotes democratic governance in countries like Moldova and Georgia, who both have elections this year, and further secures our NATO partners in Romania and Bulgaria. At the same time, we must engage with the opposition in Belarus who provide alternatives to Russian leadership in the post-Soviet world. So in conclusion, now is not the time to falter and show indifference towards threats that our allies face, nor fail to realize they are indeed threats to ourselves. After World War II, President Truman pushed the Marshall Plan to counter Soviet malign influence, support our allies and partners, and increase our standing in the world stage Organizations like NATO, 
which were born in the aftermath of World War II, are crucial to maintaining our national security by bolstering these transatlantic partnerships we've worked so hard to develop and maintain. If we turn our backs on Ukraine, or even our NATO alliance, and leave Europe to fend for themselves, then the U.S. will lose credibility, and our future assurances will undoubtedly appear hollow. Harkening back to the sacrifices of those that preceded us before, if they gave their lives, their time, their injuries, if they gave a commitment back then, and we just stand idly by today with our indifference and whittle away the foundation of the greatest period of time for democracy, <coughs> the greatest period of time for peace and prosperity that we have seen, uh, and just counter at that uh, with our apathy, uh, then we are dearly paying a, a price that will hurt generations to come, just as we were given this great opportunity as successor generations. So uh, standing together against Russia, against their unprovoked war in Ukraine, <coughs> is just one step in countering Russian malign influence around the world. But this failure now will undermine our ability to do it in the future. And this is why this is one of the most critical moments, uh, I believe, in, in our modern history. In fact, one of the critical moments for democracy in the West and democracy worldwide. So thank you for the opportunity. I hope today's uh, event uh, is something that will not only uh, help everyone that's participating in this, but will spread beyond this, uh, this room and, and carry the message forth and particularly carry that message now to the U.S. House of Representatives, where one person has said he will hold up something that has majority support, overwhelming majority support. Uh, democracy has to function here in Congress, if indeed it's to function in our country, and if it's indeed to function in this world. It is a time not for diplomacy at home in Congress, but to call it the way it is and to make sure that what's been given to us will never be lost. Thank you. Congressman Keeney, thank you very much. That was a terrific address. And we look forward to working with you in the future. All right, we're now going to have our first panel of the day. Please, the panels come up. And, oops. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. That's correct. My <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. My mistake. I, forgot. I didn't read all my notes as carefully as I should have. Okay, we have an um, address from Senator Cardin, again, who's the reason why we're in this room today, and we are very grateful to him for that. Please. Hi, I'm Senator Ben Cardin, the chair of the United States Senate Foreign Relations Committee. I want to thank the Atlantic Council and the very impressive alliance of think tanks and foundations that are hosting this conference. This gathering comes at a critical time because like after World War II, containing the Kremlin is once again one of our top priorities. Putin tells his domestic audience that Russia is the victim of the West, rewriting the history books about whether or not Ukraine should even be an independent state. But his attempt to erase the nation of Ukraine is only one step in his push to restore the Soviet Union. He is still a KGB agent who has never turned away from the legacy of crushing the rebellion in Hungary in 1956 or the reforms in Czechoslovakia in 1968 or the declaration of martial law in Poland in 1981. Today, his forces control Transnistria in Moldova, two regions in Georgia, and of course, Crimea and the Donbass in Ukraine. And for many of our NATO allies who are obligated to, who we are obligated to defend through Article 5, the only thing standing between them and Russia is a border checkpoint. That is why we in the United States must keep fighting for aid to Ukraine. I want to commend the Biden administration for their efforts in Ukraine. They saw the writing on the wall early and warned the world of Putin's plans. They have pulled out all the stops to try and keep democratic nations united against Russia's aggression. The United States and our allies impose some of the toughest, most far-reaching sanctions ever implemented against Putin and his oligarchs. I was pleased that just recently 
We passed the Repo Act. It passed out of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee by a vote of 20 to 1. Confiscating central bank assets of a foreign country with which we are not at war would be a first for the United States. But while this is incredibly consequential, bipartisan legislation, it is no substitute for supplemental funding that has been requested. As the New York Times reported, Putin is devoting nearly a third of Russia's spending next year, roughly $109 billion, to what he calls national defense. We are the only nation in the world that can match that. The vote this week to advance supplemental funding was one of the most important votes I've ever cast in all my years in office. Because if we don't send American dollars to fight Putin now, we'll have to send American soldiers to fight him in the future. We must keep in mind that propaganda has always been part of Putin's playbook. And he has already shown he is not afraid to target our own election systems here in the United States. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee report I commissioned a few years ago has truly relevant recommendations to counter Putin's asymmetric arsenal that will be helpful in the lead up to the U.S. presidential election this year. So to everyone gathered at this conference today, I want to say that we cannot give up. We cannot give up on supplemental funding to Ukraine. We cannot give up on countering his misinformation and propaganda. We cannot give up on containing Putin in the Kremlin. Thank you all for attending this conference. I wish you a productive discussion. That was a very strong message from the senator, and again, we thank him for allowing us to, getting us this room. And now I can c- properly call up our panel one to the conversation. And Andrew, thank you. I am, a, I am a practitioner of what you might call Magic Johnson approach to teamwork, which is to always make my teammates look better than me. And so I'm saying this so that to ask them to press the button when it's their turn to speak on the microphone, so you're not talking without the microphone. Okay, uh, we have six wonderful speakers here today. Uh, we're going to start with um, Andrew Weiss from Carnegie. I already mentioned that he and Gene Rumer uh, did a terrific paper on the need to contain Russia um, in the fall. So, Andrew, over to you to lead us off. So I'm not sure, John, about the technology here. Um, so I'll t- I'll, okay, now we go. Okay, thanks so much, everyone, for being here. Um, thanks to John for the very kind words of introduction. Um, I'll try to be super telegraphic um, in trying to set the stage for describing one aspect of the new Russian foreign policy that we're dealing with, which is a much deeper, qualitatively stronger partnership with Beijing. That upgrading of the Sino-Russian relationship um, really accelerated after the events of February 2022 with the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Rather than uh, simply labeling it, there have been a variety of terms that have been uh, bandied about, a marriage of convenience, friends with benefits. I think the best way to think about this is that it is one of the key pillars of the new security landscape that the current administration and any future U.S. president is going to have to contend with in the future. It's worth thinking back to the uh, Soviet-Chinese alliance that took shape in the early 1950s when Mao called for China to, quote, lean to one side due to the perceived national security threat that the United States posed to the Chinese Communist Party and a sense that Washington was Beijing's most dangerous adversary. The signing of a formal strategic alliance between Moscow and Beijing in the early 1950s paved the way for Beijing's direct intervention in the Korean War. Today's relationship between Moscow and Beijing is different. It is deeply asymmetrical. China is far more powerful in economic and political terms on the global stage. The pace of Chinese military modernization and China's rapid technological advancement set the stage 
for a role reversal that contemporary Russian leaders from Putin on down could scarcely have imagined, could scarcely have imagined when they first came into power at the beginning of the 2000s. However, that, um, I'm sorry, however uncomfortable those facts of life may be for fragile Russian egos and their own self-confidence about Russia's future trajectory, short-termism is the order of the day in Putin's Kremlin. Putin believes, rightly or wrongly, that he is in a truly existential struggle against the West. The close relationship that he is forging with China is something that he has leaned on time and again throughout the post-2022 um, period. The drivers of Sino-Russian cooperation are not new. A close relationship between Moscow and Beijing has been something in the works since the Gorbachev era in the 1980s. At that time, the final leader of the Soviet Union and his Chinese counterparts healed the, uh, the Sino-Soviet split and resolved a long-standing bitter border dispute. That paved the way for Russia and China to demilitarize a 4,000 kilometer long continental land border. It allowed them to change their resource allocation and devote their forces and their attention to more urgent threats. In Russia's case, towards the western uh, periphery of Russia, and in China's case, to threats along its coast and in the South China Sea. There's deep economic complementarity between Russia and China that has been only deepening in the post-2022 period. Russia is obviously abundant in various natural resources and commodities that China needs to power its, in, to power its economy and feed its people. There is a deep distrust of the United States global agenda, a fear that the United States sponsors regime change of regimes it doesn't like around the world and promotes color revolutions to uh, stir up trouble in countries like Russia and China. But to remember all this is to also to, uh, I'm sorry, to talk about all this is also to put in the context of wildly inflated Russian expectations about exactly what China is prepared to do. Chinese are, Chinese leaders are, if nothing else, unsentimental and profoundly self-interested. They have bided their time and selectively opened their wallets for various parts of Putin's inner circle and the Russian economy writ large. They have, a, but at the same time, the acrimonious nature of U.S.-Chinese relations in current realities that uh, are likely to dominate have fostered a deepening of Sino-Russian cooperation that even, you know, I think the most jaundiced uh, observer would admit is qualitatively new and more challenging for U.S. policy going forward. For example, China is now Russia's top trading partner. Bilateral trade turnover has topped $200 billion. The leverage in that relationship, though, has shifted decisively in China's favor. China's purchases of Russian oil and gas have helped the Kremlin cushion the effects of U.S. and European sanctions and the loss of traditional European markets. And China is now Russia's most important source of advanced technology, which will be necessary for powering the Russian defense industrial base and the economy writ large in the face of sweeping Western export controls. China, at the same time, is not stupid. They have avoided military cooperation with the Russian government that might have painted a sanctions target on its back, and they have allowed only certain companies which are ring-fenced to pursue cooperation with Russia in sensitive areas. For Russia's part, there is no such uh, care. Care and caution have been thrown to the winds. Russia has opened the spigot on sales of advanced military and other defense-related and nuclear technologies that are crucially important for China's future military and nuclear modernization programs. The window, though, for that cooperation is not infinite, and the Russians have made a, a rather shrewd calculation that it is only a matter of time before China is able to develop such things indigenously. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly for U.S. national security, is the rise of Russia-China military cooperation and the prospect of the collapse of the final U.S.-Russia arms control treaty in early 2026. After that then occurs, our nuclear planners are going to be faced with the very real prospect of having to deter and maintain strategic stability with two large nuclear powers that are fundamentally hostile to the United States. This leads to the very real prospect of arms racing with two powers that reject arms control and cooperation with the United States and a far more dangerous strategic landscape for us and future generations. Thanks so much. I forgot to put my own microphone on. Uh, Andrew, thank you. Melina, over to you to talk about how Ukraine fix, fixes, fits in Putin's revisionist agenda. Great. Well, uh, thank you, John, and thank you, Atlantic Council, uh, for taking the lead and partnering with us and, and so many other colleagues here uh, for this important conversation. Um, 
I think it's very timely that we're having this conversation today in the Senate in particular, given the votes that just took place, um, that as Congressman uh, Keating, I think, encouraged his colleagues to take up the vote um, in the House as well. And this is, this is the critical time um, to get this done for all the reasons that Congressman and Senator Cardin said. But what is the big picture here? I think that's where we have to start. Uh, the big picture is that Russia's goals in Ukraine and in the global order are unchanged. It is about political subjugation of what Russia considers its legitimate sphere of influence, its so-called former empire. This is not a war about territory. So any negotiations, conversations that some are pushing at this current moment that suggest that territorial concessions by Ukraine will somehow end this war, uh, will somehow lead to some sort of long-term peace, are not only misguided, uh, they dismiss the entire history of Russian aggression uh, that began in 2007 in a cyber attack against Estonia that, frankly, not too many people took seriously at the time and then continued in all the different ways in the former so-called Soviet space and beyond in the asymmetric domain. Uh, this report that uh, Ambassador Herbst mentioned containing Russia securing Europe, uh, one of the authors is in this room, Elina Biketova, who is our fellow from Ukraine, Please pick up uh, a one-pager. We don't have to read the whole report if you don't want to. <laughs> it is long, but it's worthwhile. Uh, but please take a look, because what I think this report does um, is it presents a holistic view of why a strategy of containment is necessary now. And I think what's important is that this report is co-written by Ukrainians and Russians. And I think what that signals to us is that it is the Russian people's desire to see a different country. It is their desire to see a Russia that is not dominated by Putin or a Putin-like figure in the future. And they understand that the West must respond to contain the ambitions of their government. So what are those geostrategic objectives? One, dominating the former empire. Um, and that really has begun in Ukraine, but certainly won't end there. Two, dislodging US global leadership. Russia has seen itself as a war, first and foremost, with the United States. If anyone in this country thinks that is not how Russians who watch Russian state-funded media or the Russian government thinks about what's happening in Ukraine, uh, they're mistaken. <coughs> this is not, from the Russian perspective, just about Ukraine. This is about undermining the United States, first and foremost, as the global leader of the West. Three, it's about exporting authoritarian tools of influence abroad and undermining democratic governments across the world, whether that's in African countries, in South America, or in the Indo-Pacific. And three, it's weaponizing international multilateral institutions in a way that serve Russian interests. Uh, the UN is a dominant example here, but there are many others in the financial system and the financial sector. So I think, what are the implications of this? Um, one, very obvious implication that I think all of us here agree on is that Russia will be able to reconstitute its military capabilities in a very, very short term. Uh, the projections are three to five years. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, uh, what I find shocking about this uh, three to five year estimate of Russia's military reconstitution is that it puts us directly with the same, in line with the same estimate for Beijing's desires on Taiwan. And so we're going to see ourselves in much more dangerous territory in the next three to five years. We're not talking a generation here. Um, if we don't do something now to defeat Russia in Ukraine. And I think the other profound long-term implication is that not only can Russia reconstitute its military capabilities now, um, it has the ability to seed military action, not just in Ukraine, but far beyond Ukraine. Um, it has millions of soldiers that it can continue to mobilize. Uh, Ukraine does not have those kinds of resources, and it's Russia's ability to carry this out will be there for the long term. So Ukraine is not the beginning, sorry, Ukraine is the beginning of Russia's imperial ambitions, but it is not the end. So if we're looking again at the big picture here, what kind of threat does Russia present to the United States? Uh, to my mind, Russia is far beyond a short-term threat and challenge to the United States. What we're seeing now is a war that may have begun as Putin's war, but is now very squarely Russia's war. So whether Putin is in the Kremlin or not, this war will continue with a future <coughs> Russian leader of some kind. 
talked to many uh, pro-democratic Russians who've all had to flee Russia today. Many of them have been with us here in Washington, D.C., <coughs> SIPA. And what they will tell you is that there is no future for our democracy in Russia in their generation. Most of them agree on this. They're still <coughs> fighting for democracy, but the chances of that are very low. And to, so in that regard, Russia is an existential threat. And I don't think we need to make a mistake about that. Um, it is not a short-term challenge. Uh, it can be a short-term challenge if we win in Ukraine. But if we fail in Ukraine, if we let Russia win in Ukraine, if we fall under the illusion that some sort of territorial uh, concessions will appease Russian interests, then we will face a much greater challenge in the foreseeable future. So last thing I'll mention that this report concludes with um, is that what does a strategy of containment look like if this is where we must go? And I agree that th there has been a really growing um, concerted, I think, set of ideas that all of us have come to from different parts of our own thinking. And I think that signals to me that there is growing agreement that the only way that we can manage Russia is by going back to the Cold War era strategy uh, of containment that begins first, defeating Russia and Ukraine, Second, reestablishing deterrence by denial in Europe. That means hardening the eastern flank, first and foremost. Third, hardening the soft targets of Russian influence <coughs> across the globe, uh, influence operations in the information space, cyber operations that the Russians have become very sophisticated at, uh, pushing back against Russia's use of PMCs uh, to prop up authoritarian governments across the globe and undermine democratic leadership. And fourth, undermining Russian dominance in his former empire. Because as long as we have so-called gray zone states, a horrible term, but non-aligned states that are not part of NATO, that are not part of the EU, in the European continent, this is what provides fodder for Russian aggression. So Moldova is very much under threat as we speak. Uh, certainly Belarus has already become a vassal state of Russia. And then we have, of course, Georgia and the other countries of the Caucasus as well. Uh, is that really a scenario we want to be living under, where more and more European states fall under Russian domination? And Russia will come back for NATO. Uh, if we think that now deterrence works in NATO territories, that is not an assumption that we have to, that we can take for granted for the long term. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was excellent and comprehensive. All right. Um, to pick up on one of the themes you mentioned, Lena, on the... Uh, going after hardening the soft spots. We have Dave Salvo from, from uh, George Marshall Fund and talk about Russian activities in cyber and disinformation, please. Cool. Was it on? There we go. Thanks very much, John. Thanks to the Atlantic Councils and all the other partner institutions for putting this event together today. Very briefly, Whatever the result of the United States presidential election in November, expect Russia's hybrid activity targeting the United States here domestically and our interests abroad to continue. Even with the U.S. administration that's willing to resolve the Ukraine crisis on Russia's, Russia's terms, even with the U.S. administration that's willing to completely renegotiate and reconceptualize the transatlantic security architecture, a weak, distracted, and divided United States will always be a central goal of Russian foreign policy, and that's not speculation, it's doctrine. If you read Russian foreign policy doctrine, if you read their military doctrine, it's stated right there. We are and will continue to be adversary number one. And asymmetric tools like cyber operations and information manipulation, these are low cost, relatively low risk methods of achieving Russian foreign policy objectives at the expense of the United States. First, let's not forget that there are domestic Russian political considerations that factor into why they engage in this activity targeting the United States. The Putin government needs an external enemy, preferably a democracy, that is weak, that is divided, that cannot hold elections without protests being held so that he could point a finger at us and justify his own authoritarian kleptocratic regime to his own people. Russian state propagandists do this on a daily basis. So the more that they are able to amplify the havoc here, the better it is for the regime's own domestic political situation at home. Second, U.S. administrations come and go. 
So tomorrow's friendly, friendly administration may in four or eight years be replaced by one that's, of course, more <coughs> willing to push back against Russian activity overseas. Russia plays the long game. And third, it's a big world out there, and Russia is trying to outcompete us everywhere it can, in Latin America, in the Middle East, in Africa, in the Western Balkans. So in the information domain, Russia, of course, is trying to amplify tensions on sensitive political and societal topics here in the United States. And we know why it does this. It's been, it does this to exacerbate domestic polarization and to move the needle on policies that the Kremlin really cares about. There's a complicated nexus of sort of the overt state propagandists, gray accounts, the troll farms, the fake inauthentic personas online, and authentic American voices who get boosted by these Russian accounts, overt and covert, and then get amplified by authentic American voices themselves who have large followings. And this is how Russian narratives become enmeshed with American narratives and mis, dis, malinformation spread in this way. This could, of course, sometimes border on the farcical. Recently, uh, Dmitry Medvedev and like-minded uh, uh, Russian propagandists have you know, spread uh, rumors that Texas is on the verge of seceding from the Union because of the border crisis uh, and that you, the U.S. is on the brink of civil war. Those don't move the needle. But there are more nefarious uh, campa campaigns. We don't need to relitigate 2016, but of course we know that at that time Russian uh, intelligence operatives and troll farms accurately captured grievance politics here uh, to inauthentically portray themselves as American voices, which you know had spectacular reach at that time. And in the context of the Ukraine war, Russian narratives targeting American audiences very perceptively shifted uh, after the first six months of the war when at first Russian propagandist state uh, media were targeting us saying, you know, trying to explain away atrocities in places like Bucha or trying to justify the invasion of Ukraine by saying, you know, Russia was provoked by the West. And after about six months, the narratives noticeably shifted to focus on the economic hardships that the United States and Western allies would face as a result of sustained support for Ukraine. Now, I'm not going to draw a direct causal link between Russian uh, propaganda and domestic considerations and, and debate in the United States, but it was around that time that slowly and noticeably domestic debate or domestic unity uh, on supporting Ukraine over the long term slowly began to fragment. So there are actual real-world re repercussions for the type of information manipulation campaigns that Russia wages targeting the United States. And of course, overseas in places like Latin America, Russia is doubling down on trying to outcompete us. RT and Espanol is the most is the most widely engaged with Russian state media network in the entire world. RT Arabic is number two. So, you know, if you think that Russia doesn't care about these regions that are, you know, far away from its its own perceived sphere of influence, that too is is, is a mistake. They are absolutely trying to convince audiences in those parts of the world that the U.S. is not a reliable partner and that Russia is, um, and that over the long term, the U.S. will abandon these regions. In the cyber domain, very quickly, Russia wants to demonstrate capabilities to escalate in times of crisis, and it's already done this by mapping out our vulnerabilities in electric, in electric grids. Uh, it has already targeted gas networks in 2022. Um, Obviously, we know about their targeting of electoral infrastructure, but it's not just limited to what happened in the 2016 presidential election. In uh, 2020, the uh, R Russian state-sponsored hackers probed voter registration rolls in uh, Indiana and California. In previous midterm cycles, it's targeted election official election websites uh, and fished candidates running for office. And obviously in 2016, it probed all 50 states' electoral infrastructure. So it has the capabilities. Perception hacking is a real thing. It doesn't have to change a vote or disenfranchise anyone to exacerbate existing distrust in the United States that the uh, US electoral process can't be trusted. And finally, of course, Russia wants to harass, intimidate, and ideally silence perceived hostile actors in the United States including many of us uh, at this table and in this room who have been uh, the subject of Russian phishing campaigns to try to, you know, essentially intimidate us. Um, that will continue. And more, I would argue, more nefariously, Russian ransomware attacks that are tied to both the FSB and the GRU, they are designed to essentially um, 
you know, sow doubt and confusion in Americans' minds that American society and governance can function <clears throat> for them. So, you know, ransom atta rare, rare attacks have targeted hospital networks, banks. This will continue, ev again, even in an environment where in Washington there's an administration that's more amenable to Russian interests. So let me conclude there and just by saying that the vulnerabilities that allow Russia to, uh, to take advantage uh, and, and wage these types of asymmetric campaigns, they're still there. This is why this activity continues. Um, our cyber networks are not secure. We have obviously, because of our openness and transparency in the information space, we have many vectors for influence, but our own domestic polarization only facilitates this type of activity. As long as that remains, this activity will continue. Thanks, John. David, thank you. That was wonderful. And Maria Snegovai is approaching, which is good because it's now her turn <laughs> to speak. Uh, Maria is at CSIS, um, a long noted expert on Russian affairs, especially internal developments and public thinking within Russia. But she's going to talk now about Russian foreign policy in what we now refer to as the global south and what that, what danger or threat that represents for us. Maria, over to you. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. It's an honor to be here. Thank you very much. And apologies for my timing. I was just briefing um, our colleagues for the press. Um, so uh, as you have seen uh, several uh, years into this war, uh, Russia is not uh, failing. Uh, in fact, it actually has shown itself quite resilient. And partly this resilience is a function of the support of the so-called Global South, Russia's successful strategy at outreaching to these countries. And uh, this is particularly important given, and I wanted to echo uh, the points that were, able, were made by previous speakers, that for Russia this is not just a regular war. This war is not just about territorial occupation, even if part of that is certainly part of that story, but it's about challenging the West, uh, really revising the international order as we know it, and while doing so, Russia certainly in need for allies. In order to create those allies, Russia has been outreaching to multiple um, actors outside of the West, uh, the Global South and Arab states, trying to pull them in its orbit, uh, among uh, the, this broader goal of building an alter alternative coalition ch challenging the Western dominance. Alternative uh, goals also include uh, reducing its uh, military uh, shortfalls on the battlefield, uh, field, how assistance with uh, circumventing uh, sanctions, uh, getting out of the international isolation, and establishing the um, broader anti-Western access. We've seen uh, in the last two years, Russia certainly actively refocusing its di diplomatic activities in that dimension, as witnessed by, for example, um, Russia's uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Lavrov, increasingly, really seriously intensifying the number of its trips to the so-called Global South. Uh, for example, multiple tours uh, around Africa in 2023, three, the Russian-Africa summit in St. Petersburg, uh, the expansions of BRICS to include many countries of the Middle East, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the strategies targeted at the uh, global south, of course, include uh, disinformation, very active disinformation activities. RT, Russia today formerly, is uh, very actively present, for example, in Africa. And uh, the legacy of the Cold War, Russia's self-presentation as this anti-colonial power, certainly helps Russia to uh, push its soft power in the region, still hurt from, with this painful memory of uh, colonialism. Uh, Anti-globalization narratives are also very present in Putin's speeches, for example, presenting it, uh, globalization as the Western tool to threaten and to challenge to hurt these countries. Uh, lastly, uh, Russia in uh, certain periods also is very successfully leveraging the threat of hunger in order to um, uh, make this uh, country's side uh, with it. There are, of course, no lack of economic uh, incentives. Uh, sanctions or convention has created multiple lucrative opportunities for these countries, many countries of the global south, Central Asian countries, Caucasus, Turkey, etc., etc. Russia also has relied on these countries for labor reserves, as you know. There is actually an ongoing active military requirement, not just Central Asia, but also Africa and increasingly Latin America, to go fight uh, to Ukraine. 
Now, who are the main actors in this process? Certainly, China is the one number one biggest factor that helps Russia sustain the war effort. Uh, we currently are working on the um, second report uh, explaining, understanding the role of um, uh, the impact of sanctions on Russia's military industrial complex. And certainly, the role of China is absolutely indispensable. Russia is substituting for every single um, Western produced good uh, that Russia needed, either by alternative supply chain chains or with uh, Chinese versions of the same uh, products. As a result, the trade between China and Russia has jumped, skyrocketed by almost 50% from 2022 to 2023, and um, probably we will we'll see more of that. Having said that, China is careful not to openly violate the sanctions, so to the extent that they supply certain goods, they try to pr provide dual-use goods, so technically outside of uh, clear violations of the sanctions, which makes it different from, say, Iran and North Korea that openly just supply Russia with military uh, type of weapons. Having said that, the U.S. Intel recently has estimated that China does provide Russia with certain uh, military components as well, but under the cover. And there are limits to this cooperation because Russia, of course, is becoming more dependent on China, while China actually sensing more power and is able to um, for example, push back on Russia, as we have seen, for example, with the power of Siberia 2 pipeline, uh, which Russia has not been able so far to uh, push forward the construction of it. North Korea is also obviously a huge uh, factor in this game, particularly when it comes to su su uh, su supply of artillery shells and munitions. Apparently, North Korea is able to produce more than Europe combined. At the very least, Russia is certainly getting more uh, from North Korea than Ukraine so far is getting from uh, Europe when it comes to uh, shells. Uh, Middle East, of course, we have seen Russia actively um, uh, engaging with Hamas. We don't know for sure to the, about the extent of real cooperation between the two uh, countries, but there is evidence that Hamas possess uh, Russian licenses to produce the Kalashnikov rifles, ammunition, its terrorists used in assault. Uh, there was also, obviously, um, some um, increase of Prigozhin flights and certain cooperation associated with uh, Prigozhin's for, for, former collaborates uh, in assisting uh, Hamas. Hamas also increasingly travels to Russia and uh, Putin sided, subtly sided with Hamas' um, uh, story after October attacks on Israel. Iran, probably the largest, uh, one another biggest story after China, uh, one of the main uh, partners with Russia with which they see a lot of areas for mutual collaboration, and especially drone uh, provision uh, on the Iranian side is extremely important. We have seen that uh, the attacks on Ukrainian infrastructure in the winter of 22-23 are predominantly done with Iranian um, drones. But there's more than that. There is uh, increase in economic cooperation, transit of goods from the International North-South Transport Corridor, and um, uh, potentially even uh, Russia sharing sensitive technologies with Iran, including uh, possibility of <coughs> nuclear uh, technologies, even if there's no clear confirmation in that regard. Now, uh, despite this growing cooperation, there are clear limits to it. Uh, the um, uh, partners, the uh, third countries, the Global South countries, are hedging, but they are more pragmatic rather than ideological in their support uh, for Russia, and they're not too eager to side with Russia given its prior status. This situation may be leveraged uh, by the West going uh, forward. Uh, as Russia is becoming more weaker and vulnerable, uh, the other countries will be more inclined to side uh, or stay side, or at least not to actively engage with Russia. That's why we have seen North Korea, Iran, more of the states are more likely to support Russia than uh, mainstream international actors. Uh, having said that, our estimation, and to conclude, uh, would certainly side with the general um, um, motto of this panel, our estimation that Russia will uh, continue to be a uh, serious challenge uh, to the West and the long-term uh, uh, long adversary of the West of the United States going forward. Therefore, with Jeff Mankov, Michael Kimmich, and Max Bergman, we also are uh, developing uh, our own uh, paper on containment, which soon will be pub published with foreign affairs. Our key takeaway is that 
uh, today's realities have changed. And what is different from the old containment is precisely this growing role of the global south. Uh, with the, without the assistance of China, Iran, other countries, uh, Russia would not have been able to pull this off so su fairly successful over the last two years. And therefore, in order to contain Russia, we need to much more actively engage with countries of the global south, primarily through investment, development, trade, and governance in order to convince these countries to pick the right side of history, so to speak. Uh, another big, uh, obviously, elephant in the room in China and the effort to peel off China from Russia somehow, perhaps by threatening sanction more actively, is probably another thing that will have to be done in the long term. Uh, lastly, we need to acknowledge that Russia is an extremely important strategic uh, challenge going forward and certainly try to overcome our partisan differences in order to provide aid to Ukraine, to allow Ukraine to do this unfortunate, the unfortunate work of containing Russia militarily for us. Thank you. Maria, thank you very much for that wonderful walk through what Russia is doing in the in the third world, excuse me, in the global south. Uh, all right, um, our next speaker is Herman Perchner, the founding president of the American Foreign Policy Council, talking about the connection between repression at home in Russia and aggression abroad. A connection, by the way, that was made very clear by perhaps Russia's greatest historian, um, Kluchevsky, who said something very pungent about that. So, Herman, over to you. Thank you, John, and thank you for taking the initiative to organize this and bring all our groups together. The first part of the assigned speech, which you didn't mention, is uh, the Kremlin's Cold War rhetoric, <coughs> which of course has its root uh, not just in the Cold War, but before. When uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov was asked, what, who are the advisors of Putin? He responded, uh, Ivan the Terrible, Catherine the Great, and Peter the Great. What does that mean? It means Ivan the Terrible began the expansion of this city-state of Moscow to 11 time zones by continual war, always to defend against threats to Moscow and to Russia. We're always defending, not on the attack, but to 11 time zones. Uh, this idea was uh, put forth in pithy form by, by Putin at the end of World War II, where he said, uh, we can install our system of government wherever our armies control. Um, in other words, the boundaries of Russia were not defined really by anything other than force. Um, more recently, you have uh, Vasislav uh, Surkov explaining Putinism, saying Russia has historical mandate and the destiny to conquer more lands and to bring more uh, territory under Russian control uh, or uh, actually being part of Russia as Russia's annexed. And these are not just uh, theories that began recently. When the Soviet Union collapsed within the first year, you had Alexander Solzhenitsyn addressing the Russian Duma uh, to talk about the establishment of the greater Slavic state, which was northern Kazakhstan, Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine. Some years later, <clears throat> you have Dmitry Rogozin talking about the need to persevere like Germany did for 40 years, coming out united in the end, meaning all the Slavic people, no matter that they wouldn't want to be unified, but it was historic destiny. In 2001, uh, a law was passed on the expansion of the territory of the Russian Federation. That law, by the way, was used to annex Crimea in 2014. So we have longstanding and deep-seated uh, roots driving uh, the policy that causes Medvedev to talk about uh, aggression against Poland, aggression against the Baltic states, aggression against Moldova, it, the, ter the statements before uh, threatening uh, the territorial integrity of Sweden, the territorial integrity of Finland that left them, led them to join NATO. Uh, all this has very deep roots. What is the connection between these ambitions and authoritarianism? Uh, because there's nobody to tell Putin to say no, it was easier or for him to go into war and to sustain 
earlier uh, setbacks that will be viewed in retrospect as a very bad mistake. Imagine if you're inside of Russia and take a look at what's happened in the next two years. Is NATO now bigger or is it smaller? Is NATO bit better funded or lesser funded? Is it more unified or less unified? And what about Russian dominance of petroleum markets in Europe? Will that come back? It will not come back. What about the political influence that went with that uh, uh, dominance in the petroleum markets? Will that come back? It will not come back. But because of Putin's system, he's able to weather this as long as he's able to sell the Russian people that there will be ultimate uh, victory, meaning he'll, through the use of nuclear intimidation, through the use of war crimes, he will be able to grab territory. However, there's a flip side to that. When the time comes, if the time comes, where he's not able to sell a vision of victory, then he's in trouble. Um, Putin, if he's seen to, by his elite, not to be a winner, uh, may well not survive. So for him, uh, continuing at any cost is not just a matter of imperialist ideology. I believe it's a matter of survival at this point, which is why you have the increasing repression. He understands the threat, so he has to repress and make it clear that anybody that st sticks their head up is in, uh, in great trouble. And I see I've hit my five-minute limit, so I'll stop. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, we now have our, the final speak from this panel, Andrea Kendall-Taylor uh, at CNES, and also before that, a long-term of intelligence off in Austin Clody, the deputy neo at the NIC for Russia. So, Andre, over to you. Bring us home. Well, I have the unenviable position of going last. Um, and it's hard to um, add a lot to what my excellent colleagues have already said. So you'll hear a lot of echoes, I think, and a little bit of repeating of the themes that you've already heard. Um, you asked me to talk about implications of authoritarianism for Russian foreign policy. And I think if there's one kind of idea or argument that I want to leave you all with is that Putin's invasion of Ukraine was his point of no return in the long-standing confrontation with the West. There's no turning back for him. And you can see since he invaded Ukraine um, that his resolve has only hardened and he has fewer options available to him. And in the um, spirit of supporting this confrontation with the West, he, has, he is underway or he is in the process of orchestrating major changes inside Russia to better position uh, and equip the country to engage in that confrontation. So first and foremost, as you've heard from some of my colleagues, is he is reorienting Russian society. The repression has increased dramatically. It was already increasing before the war, but I would say in the aftermath of the invasion, it's moving in a far more uh, dark, it's a much darker and more totalitarian direction, and I don't use the word totalitarian lightly. Um, he has... But I think as any good autocrat understands, he understands that you can't rely on repression alone. Um, repression can work for a very long time, but it creates risks and vulnerabilities for regimes that are over-reliant on it. It uh, decreases the quality of information available to a leader, and it creates a basis of discontent such that smaller acts of discontent can more quickly spiral out of control. And so in order to offset or compensate uh, for the repression, I think he's doubling down on the ideological pillar of his regime. And we can debate about how serious it is, whether or not it's internally consistent and all of that, but we've seen him really double down on these themes of um, being at war with the West, an existential struggle, the idea that Russia is a unique civilization at war with the West. Um, they're rewriting textbooks to teach children that they are at war with the West. Um, young kids are being taught to march in class. Uh, there's been a huge increase in the number of youth groups online um, that participate in increasingly fascist discourse. So there, he is reorienting Russian society around this concept of being at war with the West. Um, we've also heard about the fact that he's putting Russia on a wartime footing. Um, they are now spending 6% of their defense budget uh, on military spending. Um, they um, have their weapons manufacturers running 24-7, and there's plenty of open source information that talks about the fact that this is effective. 
Um, the number of um, missiles that they're produ producing now is uh, higher now than it was before the war. They've increased the number of tanks. They're outproducing the West in terms of ammunition. Um, Yes, there are problems with the economy um, when you are dependent on the kind of that this kind of uh, doubling down on the military industrial complex is overheating the economy. There's inflation. Um, there's problems with workers, not just the 1.5 million Russians who have left, but more and more Russians are having to shift or are choosing to shift to the military sectors of the economy because that's where higher wages are. So there are all sorts of challenges, but the question is if and when they will actually bite, and I think it would be misguided for us to expect that any sort of economic constraints are gonna change Russian foreign policy. And then the last key change, so reorienting the society around this idea of confrontation, he shifted the economy to a war time footing. And now he's also, as we've heard, is reorienting Russian foreign policy away from the West and doubling down on his relationships with like-minded partners, not just in China, but also North Korea and Iran. Um, I, the, I know there are lots of names given to this. The, my preferred term now is the axis of upheaval. Um, and essentially the problem is, is that the more leverage that these other countries have, the more that Russia has to rely on the ammunition and drones, the more Russia has to give away in return for maintaining their support. And so basically Russia is amplifying the military capabilities of America's adversaries. All of these countries are more effective when they're working together than they would be on their own. And so it really, Russia is this catalyst of an increasingly alternative axis that is in competition with the United States and the West. And these are changes that aren't going to be easily undone. As Herman just talked about, the war has become the whole legitimating source of Putin and his regime. Um, and without the war, if, even if fighting in Ukraine were to die down, he needs confrontation in order to legitimate the regime and um, the repression that they're executing at home. Um, the changes that are underway are not easily withdone. There's increasing dependencies. The Russian economy is becoming more dependent on the Chinese economy. Uh, these things aren't going to be easily unwound. As Alina talked about, these foreign policy um, contours will continue long past Putin. And a lot of the work that I've done looking at leadership change in longtime authoritarian regimes, in a vast majority of cases, authoritarianism persists the exit of a longtime authoritarian leader. And given the increasing influence of the security services within society, the, ch the prospects that it's someone from within that regime that will carry forward that type of antagonistic worst case thinking about the West um, is, is highly likely. So we have to expect it's not just Putin, but that this continues for a long time. The last thing I'll say is this confrontation is global as we've heard, but it will be most intense in Europe and Eurasia. Um, Alina already talked about uh, the different parts of Eurasia, um, but we, um, we also have to expect for NATO and as an alliance that there is a growing risk that we will become involved in a military confrontation with Russia at some point. It's not now. Yes, the Russian military is degraded and they will have to rely on asymmetric tools like disinformation, sabotage, assassinations. But as Alina said, they're reconstituting its military very quickly. You had the German uh, Minister of Defense coming out with a five to seven year time frame. Most of our Northern European allies will tell you it's, it's gonna be more quick than that. Um, and I think that the, the most likely pathway to a confrontation with Russia is if Putin underestimates NATO and read US resolve to fight. That could be for political reasons, and we can talk about the implications of President Trump and his um, disparaging comments about NATO. Um, those are things that factor into the Kremlin's calculus about America's willingness to stand up and defend our European allies. Um, we should also recognize it's not just here in the US. There is also an increase in support for far-right parties across Europe. Um, and most of these parties have views that are sympathetic to Russia. That could convince Putin that um, there won't be consensus to respond to those types of aggression, um, against his aggression. But I think the scenario that I worry about most, and again, Alina pointed this out in terms of if you're thinking about the latching up of the timeframes, um, I think the most um, problematic scenario is if the United States is already engaged in some sort of confrontation in the Indo-Pacific. Putin then could calculate that we don't have the political will 
and the military cap capabilities to defend our allies. They are two different wars, uh, a land war and a naval war, but there's a whole set of things, enablers, air-to-air -air refueling, certain types of missiles that the United States would have to deploy in the Indo-Pacific. And if our European allies and partners aren't investing in those capabilities, he could view that that is the time to test NATO resolve because we should be clear that the ultimate objective is to undermine NATO, get the United States out of Europe, because I think he views that would be the final fatal blow to this global, uh, to undermining the global order that he feels disadvantages Russia. Um, the last thing I'll just say is, I think the other thing we have to be prepared for comes back to this axis of upheaval ide uh, idea. My view is that, yes, it's a transactional partnership, but more and more, I think that there are um, greater overlap and more consistency in their views of what a future order could look like. I mean, just think about what an international order is. Strong states like the United States create an international order because it serves our interest. It serves the interests of our allies and partners. And then there's a whole set of countries that abide by the order because they have nowhere else to go. There's nowhere to defect to. So by Russia, China, Iran, North Korea coming together, they're creating a nucleus that allows other countries some place to go if they defect. And what we're seeing, I think, is increasing competition between two incre uh, uh, of <coughs> the US-led order and an increasingly viable alternative order. And just think about what has happened since Putin's invasion of Ukraine. We've had what's happening in the Middle East, uh, we've had the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. We had uh, tensions between Serbia and Kosovo. We have Venezuela threatening to take Guyana by the use of force. We've seen a huge uptick in the instances of coups in Africa. When there was a single order, those things didn't happen, but now there's increasing um, competition between the two. And so we then have to prepare for a greater risk of instability across the globe. So for all of these reasons, um, this containment policy that we're here to talk about today is, is critically important. Andrew, that was terrific, and thank you for cheering us up. <laughs> oh, we have 12 minutes. I do have questions I can ask, but I'd rather let the audience um, raise questions. So we have a microphone here. Um, if anyone wants to ask a question, come up. Um, and we could have a line, and then if you ask a question, you could then sit down. Um, but if no one wants to jump in with a question, I will, I will take the mic. But I'll give you 30 seconds if someone wants to come up. And beyond. <coughs> Brave fellow, please. Uh, thank you. Um, from the uh, Estonian Embassy, wondering if any of you would deign to comment on the whole debate about U.S. potential withdrawal from NATO and the specific comments of a specific individual in South Carolina last week. Thank you. All right. There are many interesting people in South Carolina. So if anyone wants to take it on the issue of, of U.S. NATO. I can Alito. comment on it. Or, um, please. You know, I, I, think did, I think you're referring to um, former President Trump's comments. I'm assuming that's the illusion there. Uh, I'll just say a couple of things, and I'm sure this is a, a point of a lot of disagreement. Uh, the U.S. cannot just pull out of NATO uh, because the president says uh, somewhat unhinged things. Uh, we didn't see that in the first Trump administration. Um, I don't think we're going to see that in a potential second Trump administration. There's a check on executive power in the United States. That being said, uh, our European allies should be worried. They should have been much more worried after Russia's invasion of Ukraine in 2014. And we didn't see the kind of investment that European partners in NATO should have made at that time. Uh, we're still not going to see 2% being met by all NATO members. I think that's shameful, frankly. So at the end of the day, if the specter of a Trump two term, which we don't know if that will happen or not, um, you know, pushes our allies into making sure they take defense spending seriously. And again, looking at Germany, decades. Their estimation is one decade. I think it's much longer than that. That will take them to actually have the kind of military ability to be able to defend themselves, much less be able to contribute uh, to potential Article 5 challenge in Europe uh, and to continue to support Ukraine. So I'll just say that I don't think... Uh, you know, I think the lesson learned from Trump one term is the president can say all kinds of different things, but then what actually happens looks quite different. Okay, a key on that would be 
um, who his advisors are. Uh, if they are sound advisors and have Trump presidency assuming he were to win, which we should not assume, uh, it, the problem could be manageable. If they're not sound advisors, then um, we're in the soup. I, mean, I think we have a question over here, so please come to the microphone. Hey, John, could I just, oh, geez, just yes. I just wanted to tag right. on. I think if we look back at Trump's record as a candidate in 2016 when he endorsed the Russian annexation of Crimea and then his behavior in office where he just gleefully threw most of the traditional US national security playbook out the window, embracing autocrats like Vladimir Putin, um, trashing Ukraine. Um, I think we know where he stands on NATO. He's been hostile toward our alliances. It's a potentially crippling move for U.S. Uh, global influence. And I think that, you know, the writing, you know, and his public comments are all pretty clear cut on this. You know, I don't think any of us should be surprised to see that this kind of, you know, isolationist rhetoric is increasingly prevalent in, uh, you know, the Republican uh, view of U.S. foreign policy and our role in the world, and I think it represents a real, you know, significant risk of retrenchment and destabilization on a global basis. Thanks. Hi, my name is Amanda Paul. I'm from a think tank in Brussels, the European Policy Center. Um, so, not surprisingly, my question is about EU-U.S. cooperation. Um, where do you see there could be potential to strengthen? this cooperation vis-a-vis -vis the, the war in Ukraine, I mean, to work more together. Um, the second question, how could a more isolationist US foreign policy impact European security? And do you think Europeans um, are ready to step up? Um, and if not, what could be the consequences of that? Um, and the last question, or maybe it's a comment, is about Iran. Um, I mean, to what extent do you believe the withdrawal um, of the of the um, of the nuke from the nuclear deal, of the U.S. has contributed to the Iran that exists today because Iran has become um, extremely isolated. They didn't want the deal to collapse. Um, so if this had been prevented, um, we wouldn't be seeing this sort of um, axis of evil, or at least Iran in it. And is there a way to, let's say? Um, engage with Iran on a second track um, or some other track. Okay, thank you. Who wants to take on US EU? David, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, you know, I would say that the one of the, the mistaken notions of the political faction here about um, why isolationism is in US interests and why sort of capitulation on Ukraine and capitulation on the transatlantic alliance is in the US interest, is that you know, in great power politics, <coughs> Russia is the more important partner for the United States, right? That's, that's what they would argue. I think the case that Europeans need to be making now is that that's, it's fundamentally misguided, that if you look at even just the numbers, and let's talk even before 2014 when the annexation of Crimea started and sanctions began to be levied on, on Russia, the EU is, is the trading partner that the United States ought to be prioritizing. The EU is the relationship the United States ought to be prioritizing. So I'm worried that in these factions here in the United States, there's this fundamental misconception of what the EU <coughs> represents to American interests, what NATO represents to American interests. And instead, there's this sort of warped idea that actually Russia, as a you know, so-called great power, really represents the partner we ought to be doubling down on. And if we just allow for Ukraine to be resolved on its terms and we you know, jettison the transatlantic relationship that we'll have this great trade relationship with Russia and you know, we'll be able to work things out globally with Russia. Obviously that's fundamentally misguided. That, that misunderstands Russia and Russian interests and Russia's uh, approach towards the United States as we've heard from you know, all the panelists up here. So I think, I think European, our European friends need to be really sort of honing in on that message right now um, explaining why this relationship, and I know you did this exercise already for four years in the first Trump administration, but it is, I think, vitally important to do now. David, thank you. Um, the isolation question? Sure. I think the one thing I would add just on the EU cooperation is the one issue that doesn't get enough airtime here in the United States is the issue of EU enlargement and working and uh, EU accession for Ukraine. 
Um, and obviously that is a first and foremost European issue, but there's a whole lot the United States could do to help Ukraine meet conditions and other things and, and try to support and move that process along. But I think that's critically important. Um, and I would love to see the US play um, a more supportive role in that process. Um, the question I think you had is, well, is Europe prepared to step up in the absence of a more isolationist um, US? And it, you know, I guess it's, the direction of travel is positive. I mean, I guess you can see, um, and we know, and again, another kind of talking point that doesn't get enough airtime here in the United States is that it's our European partners who are actually doing more for Ukraine together than the United States on its own. And that's a really positive thing um, that, that more people need to recognize. And so the direction of travel, I think, has been very positive. Um, but it needs to continue, and it needs to continue more seriously. And I'll just go back to the one scenario that I gave before. Yes, European governments are increasing their percentage of uh, their budgets that they're spending on defense. They're getting closer to the 2%, but we also have to think how that money is being spent. And so if the United States were to be engaged in the Indo-Pacific, we have to be sure that some of that growing defense uh, spending is going towards the capabilities that the United States would have to withdraw. So I think the direction of travel is positive. There's still a long way to go, as Alina said, um, but, but we've got to keep the pedal to the metal. And I think the other issue, again, I don't think we've really touched on it in this session, is the defense industrial base. Yeah. It's an issue here in the United States. It's an issue in Europe. And so that's another area. I mean, I guess if we're talking, you know, talking about another area of uh, cooperation, co-production and other things is also, um, I think, another fruitful and needed area. Okay, Alina, then Harmon. Just a, a quick uh, two finger to um, Andrew, which is uh, to uh, Andrea, I'm sorry. Um, you know, I, on the defense industrial base, um, there's a really shocking uh, chart that I was just looking at in this report, um, assessing Russia's capability in military modernization by specific system in its annual production, some page 19. And I think anybody that is in the DOD or on the SASC and the HASC really needs to look at this and assess whether we can even compete I'm not saying we should be producing the exact same capabilities as Russia is producing to carry out a land war against Ukraine, but it is huge. I mean, it's two, just ammunition alone, two million rounds a year. We cannot produce that. We cannot. Neither can the entire NATO alliance. Um, and so these kinds of gaps um, speak directly to the whole um, defense industrial complex uh, capability gaps that we have seen as a result of the war and integrating that with the European defense industrial base is going to be key for long-term security and for Trump proofing the alliance frankly. Herman? Our lack of industrial capability uh, plays into the larger problem namely that if a country's threats and guarantees are not believed your diplomacy becomes a bit impotent and the influence in the world declines. You give incentives to other countries to look for different ways to protect their interest. And uh, it takes not so long to destroy uh, the world's confidence in the U.S. That's happened a lot and it's going to take some time to, to bring it back. But right now we have a problem. All right. We have um, 30 seconds. I'm just going to make one, one last comment. Uh, there was an important meeting. The administration called industrial leaders to the Pentagon um, two years ago, not too long after the big invasion, to talk about this. But there has not been a great deal of progress since, either here in the United States or working with our allies abroad. Um, we focused today, or we're focusing today, on the threat especially posed by Moscow. But whether you think Moscow is the main threat or Beijing is the main threat, um, we need to substantially up our game with industrial production, as do our allies and partners. And this should be a focus as well going forward. With that, time is up. We have a coffee break, and it's going to be a, a very disciplined coffee break. <laughs> so you have 15 minutes to grab something, and then we're going to be resume. Thank you. And thank our panel for a wonderful discussion. Okay, our... our Disciplined coffee break was not quite as disciplined as I imagined, but that was for reasons beyond our control. Anyway, we're going to start right now with Ambassador General Lute, uh, Congresswoman Kaptur, um, will be here shortly. Uh, Doug Lute, retired three-star general, retired ambassador, retired national uh, 
Deputy National Security Advisor. So a man with extraordinary experience on national security issues, understands well the consequences for American interests of a rogue Kremlin, and a co-conspirator of mine. Uh, we've traveled Europe together, pushing for a stronger American policy, stronger European policy, vis-a-vis um, -vis Ukraine and NATO. With that, I'm gonna turn this over to Doug. Thank you for coming, Doug. Okay, so I have only brief remarks today. And it seems to me my job is to bridge from the morning panel, or the first panel, which was sort of diagnosis, to prescription, uh, the second panel. So I'll try to do that. And um, I thought what I'd do here is try to offer a little bit of historical perspective. Um, you know, many people these days suggest or observe that we're at a historic inflection point, a pivot point. The Germans, so you gotta love the Germans, Zeitenwende, right? I mean, they've even invented the word. Um, and it strikes me that maybe we are, but as I thought about this, I ask myself, when previously in my professional career did I experience, or was I in the midst of a pivotal moment, and maybe didn't quite realize it? Uh, and what could those previous experiences tell us about this one? And does it really kind of inform this pivotal moment? And as I thought about that, two other historical points came to mind. Uh, and, and I think in both cases, they proved to be inflection points. The first one, it's already been mentioned this morning, obvious in this context, 1989 to 1991, right? 89, the wall falls. I was a young army major on the inter-German border. That itself is a historical term uh, these days, right? It's gone. Um, 91, the wall falls. A year later, Germany reunifies. A year later, the Soviet Union dissolves. Uh, and when I was there on the border at that time, you know, I kind of missed it. I, I mean, okay, we, there were people coming across the border when they weren't coming across before. We continued to report as good army officers, right? As though nothing had changed. And it wasn't really, I think, until years later that I fully appreciated at that time that I had actually lived a moment in history on that border in 1989. And it also occurs to me, another lesson of inflection points, right, is that there's an initial shock, that is, the wall comes down, right? And then there tend to be a series of aftershocks, historic aftershocks. And in a way, the, what's playing out today in Ukraine is essentially an aftershock of 89 to 91. Uh, and these aftershocks play out perhaps over decades, and even today. The second such moment for me was across town on 9-11. So I was on the staff in the Pentagon at the time. I'd done okay since being a young Army major. I was now a not-so-young Army colonel, uh, working for Hugh Shelton, who was then the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And we were on our way that morning to a NATO meeting in, I think, Hungary or someplace, okay? Uh, it was, must have been a CHODS meeting, Chief of Defense meeting. Uh, we had overflown Manhattan on the way to this NATO meeting. All was clear, bright September morning, no problem. As we flew towards the coast of England, the pilots on this military air, airplane in which we were traveling came back and said, you know, sir, we were listening to BBC radio, and there's this strange report that a plane has hit the North Tower. We thought, oh, boy, that's strange because it's such a beautiful September day. Must have been a small private airplane. Maybe there was a health incident with the pilot or something. How tragic. A few minutes later, second plane, second tower. We turned around and flew back. Um, about halfway over the Atlantic, we picked up two fighter aircraft, one on each wing, to escort the chairman, not me, uh, the, chair, and the chairman and his loyal staff, okay, uh, <laughs> us, uh, back to Andrews Air Force Base. We overflew Manhattan, and now, of course, the plume of smoke had risen uh, over 10,000 feet. Landed at Andrews, as soon as the doors of the airplane opened, we could smell the smoke from the Pentagon, which was still burning, right? So at a second time in my professional career, I, I lived a touch of history. I lived in the midst of a historical moment, right? And it, you know, on that day, I didn't fully appreciate. I didn't have any idea what to expect because of those attacks on America on 9-11-2001. But it turns out, 
we lived with the aftershocks of that event for the next 20 years. I mean, 20 years in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq was, was, a, uh, uh, was a, an aftershock in whatever way um, from 9-11 and so forth. So as I thought back on these two previous incidents, so 89 and September 11, um, I reflected that, you know, I believe that the Russian invasion almost exactly two years ago now was the third such occasion in my professional life. Um, it violated every major rule of the road all the way back at least to the UN Charter in 1945. Uh, the basic tenets of the United Nations, the basic tenets of the post-World War II order, territorial integrity and, um, and national sovereignty were violated in the most brutal way. Full-scale war in Europe for the first time since 45, launched by a major power with the aim of occupying and subjugating a smaller neighbor. And of course, the initial shock of this historic event is inside Ukraine itself and being suffered by the Ukrainian people, right? Many of whom are now displaced uh, or refugees. And we've seen early aftershocks, even though we're so close to this event at the two-year mark, we're beginning to witness, to experience the aftershocks, right? Refugees flowing out of Ukraine. The sanctions regime with the intent to isolate Russia both politically and economically. Uh, Finland and Sweden making national choices to join NATO. Uh, NATO adopting uh, regional defense plans uh, that it hasn't had in place with specific forces, with specific defense responsibilities on specific timelines. They've not had that kind of planning in place since the end of the Cold War. The interruption of grain and fertilizer coming out of the Black Sea fleet the Black Sea fleet, the Black Sea uh, uh, ports, and really, in many ways, uh, feeding the global south. Western Europe, uh, re-engineering the energy supply lines away from the unreliable Russian uh, energy sources. Global inflation. So these aftershocks, are, we're already experiencing some of these. My message today, though, that is that if past is any indicator, if previous inflection points are any indicator, this is just the beginning. We are going to feel these aftershocks for perhaps decades to come. It may even uh, extend all the way to the future of the Russian Federation. Uh, and many of these will play out slowly. They'll arrive on the scene without warning, uh, and they'll be very difficult to anticipate. So we're in the early days of this shock. My main point today is we need to wake up. This is a historic inflection point. That's not just rhetoric. It's not just a new German word, Zeitenwende. We need to wake up, pay attention, understand what's at stake, and respond now in an attempt to get in front of some of these aftershocks and perhaps prevent some of the worst aftershocks. How we respond now will dictate this, how the war ends in Ukraine, and it'll dictate the scale and scope of aftershocks in the decades ahead. Now, as we look forward to the next panel, let me be clear. Ukraine can win this war. And ensuring Ukraine wins is a vital national interest. This is the first, this is job one. This is first things first. Ukraine must win this war. It is not too late. Don't take the reports of the last several months off the battlefield as indicators of where this is headed or where it must lead. Ukraine can win this. As the next panel will address, much more can be done, politically, economically, militarily. Uh, and that's the basic point, I think, is that containment, the title of this session today, begins with Ukraine winning the war, right? There's no viable path. I don't see a viable path to containing Russia if the result is that Russia wins in Ukraine. So as a military guy, I thought I'd offer a few military points up front, right? And then obviously uh, introduce the other speaker and then uh, the panel. So on the military front, even once Congress approves additional US military support, and even as our coalition partners sustain their support, we must change our approach, not just the funding, but our approach to military assistance. We have to abandon this step-by-step -step incremental approach that has been the pattern over the past two years, and in no small part has led us to where we are today. 
Uh, so yes, you had the two major combatants, Ukraine and, uh, and Russia, but our military support, as it's been delivered in these penny packets, has contributed to the stalemate on the ground today. Ukraine is paying an unsustainable price for this incremental approach. Time is not on Ukraine's side. So when we say to Ukraine, we're with you as long as it takes, that's not good enough. We must be with Ukraine as long as it takes, with as much as it takes, as soon as it's needed. And that has not been our pattern over the last two years. In short, today, we've provided Ukraine enough not to lose, but not enough for Ukraine to win. And this has to change. Additional funding uh, added to, uh, combined with the sus simply sustaining the old approach, the incremental approach will not take us to a good place. It will not take us to a good place. So we need to change our approach. And I have two ideas of how that approach might change. Two specific ideas, and these are both military ideas. Um, and I think they're mutually supporting as I reflect on them. First, while Ukraine shifts to a defensive posture, which it is doing now by, uh, by just by <laughs> necessity, uh, because of our incremental support, we should use 2024 to build for Ukraine a real combined arms capability. Organizing, training, and equipping a force needed to eventually evict the Russian occupiers. This cannot be done on the cheap. It can't be done on the fly. It can't be done with a few weeks of training at Grafenbeer, Germany. It can't be done with only the bits, only parts of the combined arms team. We tried that approach in 2023, and we now see the results. So build, the first piece of advice is to change approaches and build a real combined arms team. And use 2024, while Ukraine is, on, is, is essentially on the defense, to do that. The second is that while we build this combined arms force, we should this year provide Ukraine the quantity and quality of long-range precision strike systems to isolate Russian forces occupying Ukraine, attacking their command and control, their strike, uh, their strike uh, forces, and their logistics capabilities. Such a campaign of long-range strikes would help protect Ukrainian civilians and civilian infrastructure as well. You can't defend Ukrainian cities from air attack only on the, at the point of impact. You have to take that defense to the launch sites, whether they're in occupied uh, Ukraine or even, in, in my view, all the way onto uh, Russian territory. Equally important, this campaign would exploit not the strength of the Russian deploy, uh, defense. We wouldn't be attacking into the teeth of the Russian defense, but it would rather exploit the weaknesses of the Russian forces, their indiscipline, their lack of cohesion, their poor leadership, poor logistics. The Russian force is a low quality force sitting behind very, uh, very deep uh, and effective defenses. We should overfly those defenses and attack their weakness while avoiding their strength. Uh, in particular, Russian logistics are very vulnerable to long-range precision strikes. That's because Russia has always been an army that depends on rail-based logistics. Railroads are fixed targets. You can attack them, you can re-attack them, you can attack the repair teams, and you can impede greatly Russian uh, logistics. And you can, in effect, isolate and make untenable the Russian occupiers. The iconic case in point here is the Kerch Strait Bridge uh, and the railroad which uh, supplies uh, Crimea and enables the continued Russian occupy, occupation of Crimea. So a long-range strike campaign would exacerbate the weaknesses of the Russian occupying army, isolating them and making their occupation unsustainable. Such long-range strike systems, such as the U.S. Attackums and the German Taurus, are available, and they are effective if we provide them in sufficient quantity. We have to, in short, provide Ukraine what it needs on an emergency basis to win this war. Now, look, I'll, I'll close here. I don't want to turn this into a an Army War College uh, lecture. Uh, I want to thank the Atlantic Council and the consortium of other think tanks that put this opportunity together. Uh, I thought I'd offer a little historical context. I hope I've done that. And maybe just give you an appetizer 
uh, for the kind of prescriptions that I think we'll hear from the second panel. Okay, thanks very much. Doug, that was outstanding, absolutely outstanding. And you gave us enough time, or gave Congresswoman Cap enough time to arrive without interruption. So thank you. So it's my great pleasure to introduce um, Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur, who I believe has been in the Congress since um, 1983. Um, I, also the longest woman, longest serving woman in Congress. Am I correct about that? Or am I putting my foot in my mouth? Yes. Yes, that's true. That's true. <laughs> and from a personal standpoint, more important, a long-term co-conspirator in projecting American interests, not just in Ukraine, but across Europe. So Congresswoman Kaptur, over to you, and thank you for being with us today and for everything you do. Is it afternoon yet? Uh, almost. All right. Well, first of all, thank you all for being here and for being witnesses to uh, liberty halfway around the world and in your very important work. I'm seeing the ambassador here, former ambassador, and uh, so many intellects and so forth. Uh, are you taping this? I guess you're so others can hear. That's, that's really wonderful. And thank you so much for inviting somebody from the house side. We don't often get over here. So we have our own set of challenges, right? So it's just great to be here uh, with you today. And uh, the, uh, with me today are two individuals who work in our congressional office here in Washington, uh, Jacob Jernigan uh, on the foreign policy side, and then Juven Jacob, who handles many, many of my uh, personal matters and uh, uh, makes sure that I have all the materials that I need and does a lot of research for us. So I thank both of them for coming uh, with us today. And I want to thank the Atlantic Council in particular <clears throat> for your invaluable work and the time you've devoted to this and all of the excellent panelists uh, that will be involved in thoughtful discussions all day uh, on the nature of the real threats uh, that our free world uh, faces. I happened to travel to uh, Soviet-occupied Ukraine the first time in 1973, and I remember vividly every single experience I had, and I'd like to give speeches about what it feels like to live as an American, to live in a place that is, is consumed by tyranny. Um, so we live and gather at a time of, uh, that's critical for humanity, for our nation, and certainly for our allies. And I thought I might begin with a quote from Ambassador Herbst, who's one of my teachers, that uh, peace and stability are critical to American. Peace and stability in Europe are critical to America's peace and stability. And that our strategic objective as uh, foundress and co-chair of the Ukraine caucus in the House, is to restore Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity within its 1991 boundaries. That is the goal of the free world. And for the weak of spirit or doubters, let me quote a sage who observed to me, if you by chance take no interest in foreign affairs, foreign affairs will find you. So across the European continent uh, lie the bodies of over half a million Americans, soldiers who saved the world from tyranny in the 20th century in World Wars I and II. That is an astounding number. Recently, I went to the internet and I um, looked up some of the film from the Defense Department uh, of some of our generals, like Omar Bradley and George Marshall. I think if those could be consolidated somehow, and shown to the American people, you could help teach. Because in many states like my own, the teaching of history and geography has been eliminated. And so civics is something precious to us. And we need to understand that it's understood poorly in some parts of our own country, which is shocking, actually. But for those of us who are privileged to be here today, uh, living in a free society, the sacrifice of those who gave their lives for us and to our European allies uh, was bequeathed to us. 
we didn't earn it. And so for you even to be here today is a um, uh, wonderful, uh, energizing uh, moment for me. As current events from the Red Sea to the Baltic and Black Seas can attest, it is critical that we rise to this century's call to defend Ukraine. My God, they're fighting for it. Why wouldn't we help them? We must avoid becoming passive observers as the free world's collective future is paid for us. We can see what's happening. It's beginning to emerge by the enemies of liberty. Some Americans believe that our struggle against global tyranny ended with the defeat of Nazi Germany and the fall of the Soviet Union. And that is really a very naive and dangerous belief, lulling some into an attitude of appeasement as the new pages of history are being written. Criticism has come from some individuals who sadly uh, have no knowledge of our history and no veterans in their family. They are very, very insulated from world events, which you are not just by being here. But recognize that. Today, in terms of enlistment in the military, uh, only about 1% of America's families are even directly connected. So the kind of world view that our predecessors had does not exist uh, in the collective consciousness of many in our country. And I often say, are you a free rider in our nation? And when I go out to classes and I ask the students, how is it you have the gift of freedom to begin your life? Uh, what's the history of your family? And they don't know. So we have a bit of an education job to do in the country. And a huge sacrifice for liberty is being rendered by the people of Ukraine today. They are teaching the world what it is to fight for liberty when you've never had it. So all gathered here understand what the challenge really is. And we are guided by a quote from Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death. And that is what the people of Ukraine are fighting for. Vladimir Putin has an affinity um, for tyranny. And he's let us know what he intends to do to restore hegemony over many of our European allies. It's no secret, and countries like Finland and Sweden have sought to join NATO uh, for the first time as they understand the fateful chessboard on which they exist. And we know that Russian troops have locked down not just in Ukraine, but in Georgia and Moldova. So it's clear the emerging, the emerging um, map is becoming a bit more clear. Uh, Putin has been neither secretive nor unclear on his objective. He seeks utter and complete subjugation of Ukraine and interference with uh, former Warsaw Pact nations. I think it's very instructive to look at the, the first uh, year of invasion of Ukraine 2014, just a few days before that occurred by Russia. Uh, he was uh, at the Sochi Olympics and had this film uh, that he did about the history of Russia. I was sitting in my living room with rolled up socks and throwing it at the TV because it was such a lie. But that was sent out to a gigantic viewing audience in the information warfare that is engaged in this particular battle we are in with our, with our um, allies uh, to help Ukraine win. Uh, is an antidote to that film. If you haven't looked at that Sochi Olympic uh, propaganda piece, it's worth your time. Russia's history is one of illegal expansion as far west in Europe as Berlin, as we know. And uh, the, uh, there was a clear attempt with the Nord Stream 2 pipeline to compromise European energy security. And I want to compliment Poland uh, signing a contract with Westinghouse to build nuclear facilities in Poland and trying to find an energy independent road forward for our allies in Europe. Very important objective. Russia pursues its uh, own objectives following a ruthless calculus, one that estimates uh, the number of votes for Ukraine in the Congress will run out before Putin depletes his supply of rubles and Russian lives, Russian troops' lives. America's support is essential for Ukraine to emerge victorious. And the fight against tyranny requires the Western alliance to hold fast. 
And uh, we live in an instant age of everything. Well, this isn't instant. And we have to remain resolute. Of the military aid our country provides, 75% is actually spent on procurement in this country. And it represents about 4% of our military budget. So one can ask the question, how much is NATO worth? How much is it worth? And we have to make that calculus, and I know what I believe. We have some members of the House who don't agree. So your presence here today is very important. And I want to congratulate the Senate on passing the bill that includes the assistance for Ukraine. Uh, nearly two years ago, on February 24, 2022, Ukraine, the poorest nation in Europe, stared defiantly into the eyes of a bristling Goliath, one with the third largest military in the world, a land mass that vastly dwarfs its own, and a population four times its own. I think it has, what, how many time zones does Russia have? It's huge. 11? 11 time zones? I mean, it's enormous. And here you have this nation about the size of Texas, and they are fighting with everything in them. And they fought at our side. In Iraq, in Afghanistan, the Ukrainians stood with us. At Kyiv, Ukraine's military stopped the massive Russian tank column that aimed to pierce its heart. And that was an astounding moment in history to remember. If you look at the film Torn from the Flag about the Soviet invasion of Budapest in 1956, that tank column made it all the way in. It's a stark contrast to think about what happened in Ukraine and what happened in Budapest. But unlike the tragic Soviet invasion of Budapest, Ukraine stood its ground. And the entire Russian advance had been stopped in its tracks. That is a piercing moment. Since Putin's illegal invasion in 2014, the Ukrainians have resolutely refused to blink. Their bravery is unrivaled. And in the last two years, they've liberated 50% of the territory captured by the Russian troops starting in 2014. <clears throat> and they delivered significant blows that have destroyed as much as 40% of Russians' military capacity. Think about that. They are achieving this miraculous defense through the steadfast courage and sacrifice of its people, coupled with the technology and material support of we in the West. A Russian victory in Ukraine would be an historic tragedy and a blow to liberty. And surely, the countless war crimes committed by the Kremlin, I met with more families whose children have been abducted, and they're trying to get them back. Um, the Kremlin shows its true intent to eradicate all signs of independent Ukrainian nationhood and culture. I can remember when I tried to find, when I was in, oh, I think I was in Moscow. I was trying to find a church to go to, and it was really interesting. I'm a Catholic of the Roman variety, and it's an imperfect variety, let me assure you of that. But I tried to find a church, and I did. Hardly anybody was in it, but the mass was said only in foreign languages. It was not said in Russian. That was very interesting to me. So that was just one small slice of lack of freedom of religion. But anyway, um, Ukraine seeks access to the community of free nations in Europe, and Putin simply can't accept that eventuality. So look at what is already occurring in occupied Ukraine. Russians are severely repressing the independent Orthodox Church of Ukraine, the Uniates, other Catholics and Protestants, Jews, Tyranny knows no bounds. It has utter cruelty and repression. I can remember being followed uh, on our early trips to Soviet-occupied Ukraine. I can remember all of the listening devices in the walls and no drapes on the windows and only cold water and a big, huge person sitting outside our room. I don't want to live that way. As history teaches, the consequences of a Russian victory would hardly be confined to Ukraine. It would be a disaster for the Western Alliance of Free Nations that has served as liberty's bastion for three quarters of a century. Tyranny can only be checked by a united front. As President Biden has said, Moscow might well follow a victory in Ukraine with an attack on our NATO allies in the Baltics or Poland. And the spider web of tyranny that we witness forming between Russia, Iran, North Korea, must be met with intelligence and full resolve. If we fail to send Ukraine the support it so dearly needs to halt the Kremlin, the cost will far exceed the $60 billion currently stalled in Congress. 
and it may well cost us American lives, as well as our NATO alliance being challenged militarily. Abandoning Ukraine would undermine America's strategic leadership of the free world with more aggressive and insidious policies and practices emerging from what I call the spider web of tyranny of Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea as they purchase one another's weapons and they try to defeat Ukraine's brave, brave soldiers. Providing the support Ukraine needs to stop the Kremlin is in the best interest of our national security, our global security, and the strength and vitality of our democratic alliances. So this is not only the judicious and rational move. It is our moral imperative as, as leaders of the free world, along with NATO. And together with our European allies, we must stand with those who are living, fighting, dying, and enduring major life-changing injuries to achieve a better life under liberty's umbrella and for Ukraine to seek access to the community of a free Europe, which she so desires. Thank you very much for your time and your attendance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Okay, may we have our panel come forward. Marsha, over to you. Well, hello, everybody. So uh, this panel is um, bat and clean up here. Uh, we had, um, obviously, a number of really super interesting uh, speakers uh, earlier. Uh, and then the previous panel uh, that talked about Russian foreign policy and the rise of authoritarianism. This panel is, a, is uh, you know, the response to panel number one. Uh, what are the solutions to what we see in Russia's foreign policy and the rise of authoritarianism? in Russia and um, elsewhere in the world. So we've got an all-star panel here, um, but first just a couple of administrative um, points. Um, each, each panelist will make um, opening uh, remarks from three to five minutes, uh, and then we will probably go right to questions. And um, if, so if I could ask everybody to start thinking about what questions you want to ask, because this is a real opportunity to ask some world experts on, uh, on these issues. Um, and we are going to um, break up promptly at 1 o'clock so that we can um, have lunch <laughs> and perhaps continue uh, the discussion. So I'm going to turn first to uh, Ambassador Stephen Sestanovich, who is the, um, and actually just one thing before I uh, do that, one more administrative comment, uh, which is if people on the panel could remember to uh, turn the mic on and off, and if you all could remind me this, about the same thing, because I often tend to forget that. Um, so uh, we're going to start with Ambassador uh, Steve Sestanovich, who has a very illustrious um, career in, in many different ways. Um, uh, he is now the Kennan Senior Fellow for Russian and Eurasian Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. Great. Thank you, Masha. And thank you to John for, and the Atlantic Council for organizing this. <clears throat> I thought I'd start by acknowledging that the word containment has a kind of dated uh, Cold War feel. Uh, and uh, and take it from there. You know, you could respond to the dated Cold War feel by saying, uh, you know, hey, that was a great Western policy success. Uh, but I think that's not really enough, and we need to understand a little bit more about the historical uh, origins and uh, complexity uh, of uh, containment as a strategy. Well, what it meant um, in, over a, a period of decades, how comprehensive it was or wasn't, um, and what a contemporary application would, uh, would require. Um, the embrace of containment um, settled one thing in the late 40s. After two years uh, since the end of World War II of policy 
paralysis and intellectual paralysis. It identified the Soviet Union as the top foreign policy priority uh, of the United States uh, and gave that policy a name. But there was a lot that it didn't settle. Uh, and I think it's important to remember all of those, uh, of those things because they were debated for, uh, for decades. Uh, containment in its variations had ad different advocates uh, and opponents uh, who proposed adjustments and modifications that included rollback, uh, which is to say containment wasn't enough. We needed to push the, uh, the line uh, back. Uh, detente, uh, personal symmetry with the Soviet leadership, uh, trade and technology transfer policies, um, rivalries outside Europe, uh, which actually in included some of America's most costly uh, foreign policy enterprises uh, over a number of decades. Uh, negotiations on arms control, ideological confrontation. Um, in some, uh, there was this new strategy in the late 40s, but its details were up for grabs. Um, containment didn't answer all questions, uh, and adopting it today, I'm, I'm sorry to say this to the other members of the panel, uh, will not answer all questions uh, either. Um, but it did answer one very important question that went beyond just identifying the Soviet Union as the top foreign policy priority of the United States. Um, all of these variations that I've mentioned were about how to interact with Soviet leaders, about how to view the Soviet Union's internal affairs, uh, its management and uh, tyrannical uh, oppression of its bloc, uh, and so forth. They were not about policies on what I would call our side of the line. Um, containment did draw a line that it was very clear about. It said to keep, it was imperative to keep Soviet power and influence from threatening the integrity of the Western Bloc, of countries that had associated themselves with the United States. And from this, many other policies developed. Uh, uh, this commitment to our side of the line, mutual defense, uh, political and economic coordination and assistance, uh, even integration, um, there was a very limited acceptance of gray zones uh, as part of containment, especially in regions that were deemed uh, central to American interests. Uh, it is somewhat, it's often forgotten how early these controversies arose uh, in, the, in the course of the Cold War and discussion of containment. They didn't wait for the anti-war movement in Vietnam. Uh, George Kennan himself proposed an alternative to uh, containment, which you might want to go and read about, called Program A. Program A involved the acceptance of the neutralization of Germany. Um, and it was considered unacceptable by the rest of the Truman administration. And suddenly George Kennan, the author of containment, found himself not at home uh, in the State Department and the U.S. government. Um, containment involved very limited acceptance of neutral zones in Europe, and we can say more about that uh, later. But applied to today, the most important thing that it would mean, the key feature of containment as a strategy toward Russia, would be an emphasis on Ukraine's success. Uh, as a successful democratic system with a prospering economy, a united society, and unquestioned military support from the West. Um, you know, for m almost a decade in the, after containment was adopted, West Germany uh, was not a member of NATO. But it involved the same kind of commitment that I've just described for Ukraine, uh, commitment to uh, mutual defense, 
prospering uh, society, unified uh, politics, and unquestioned military support. Um, it wasn't a, West Germany was not a member of NATO, but it was integrated into Western uh, uh, it, uh, defenses. So there was a keen sensitivity through this adoption of containment, what it mean, what it could, what could be debated about containment, and what couldn't be. Uh, and I think that's what we will, that kind of sensitivity will be uh, needed uh, is if we adopt uh, containment today. The crucial element of it will be, I'll just repeat, uh, a commitment to sustain the unity uh, and legitimacy of, uh, uh, of Ukraine and its political uh, leadership. Thank you. Thanks very much, Steve. Um, so, uh, Roger, if I could uh, turn to you. Uh, Roger Zackham is the Washington Director of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you, Atlanta Council. Um, it's an honor to be here and be with this uh, esteemed group of panelists. I'm going to take a stab at really building on what we heard from Ambassador General Lute earlier, uh, because I think he really outlined uh, what needs to happen militarily. And so I'm going to foot stomp a bit and perhaps add. But fundamentally, as we talk about containment, which I think is the right kind of construct, um, taking into account the prior panelists' comments, in terms of the outcome we want broadly with respect to Russia and Europe, with respect to Ukraine, we need rollback. And I think that's a key message I want to uh, share today. So in order to realize containment, the containment of Russia, we need to roll back Russia out of Ukraine, uh, which is perhaps a bit of a twist on what traditional thinking of, of containment, whereas roll, rollback is an alternative. Um, and that may not surprise folks that I uh, come from the Reagan Institute and I have taken about 30 seconds before I talk about rollback. But there we go. It rhymes with the past, and I think rollback is necessary here. But in terms of what uh, General Lute uh, said earlier, I really want to foot stomp what needs to happen Militarily, what you heard him say, he used this, uh, this word, which at times has grown out of fashion, even with uh, the prior uh, general, uh, commanding general in Ukraine, which is, he used the word win, I believe. He wants to see the Ukraine winning. Well, I think that's what we need to, we, we need to uh, continue to pursue strategies that realize victory, which is the rollback. And uh, there are a few things we need to do, and I think the, way, the reason why we're not there, uh, General Lute outlined a few of those reasons, which is the drip, drip, drip of support without uh, actually giving security assistance in a fashion that would allow us to win. And we know the, the challenges we face domestically, politically in the United States, when we say, you know, we're going we're to be with them as long as it takes, people actually don't want it to take long. They want Ukraine to win now. And there are decisive things we could do to help realize that outcome. Um, first is the air defense piece. That needs to happen. I think uh, stalemate, such as yeah, um, uh, um, was previously articulated by the outgoing uh, commanding general in Ukraine, uh, is not the sort of Cold War notion that things will just stay frozen. This is a live conflict. And stalemate will at some point uh, result in a different outcome. And in the absence of providing this aid, it will result in a Russian win. We need to understand that. So we can't feel like, oh, well, stalemate's okay. We can realize our strategic objectives with it. We need to continue to support the Ukrainians so they have a chance to win. Otherwise, they will lose. Um, air defense, if it's not addressed, will result in a Russian victory. Uh, one of the reasons why the supplemental, I don't know if I'm the first one to, to hit on that in uh, the second part of the session, needs to go through because it actually takes steps to help with the air defense in terms of Patriot battery systems. Uh, I'll note that the Europeans have been helping with that as well. Second, air power. We need to deliver F-16s. Notably, as much as people in this chamber, well, this body, not in this chamber, we're sitting in the Senate, but those in the House want to talk about how uh, Europeans are not doing their part. The F-16s that are going to the Ukrainians came from Europeans, not the United States. So you have to commit formally to F-16s. This will have a material impact on the battlefield if, as uh, Ambassador General Lute spoke earlier, they're allowed to target Russian positions not just on the Ukrainian side of the border, but on the other side of the border. I don't mean to put words in the mouth of General Lute, but that was certainly the implication of what he was saying. I fully stand behind. It is proportional, consistent with law of armed conflict, that you can target the enemy when they are targeting you from within their sovereign territory. That is open game, and one that this administration, at least as respect to the attackums, and I believe as would, would apply to the F-16s, has said, thou shalt not use 
our systems for targets in Russian territory. That is a huge mistake. That is a recipe for loss. We need to be very clear-eyed about it. We're imposing rules that the law of armed conflict doesn't impose on combatants. Attackums is related to the same point. They have the munitions, but the munitions are not having the strategic impact if they can only go as far as Ukrainian sovereign territory, right? But certainly can't go to date, as I understand it, uh, into Russian territory. Now, there are only 20, we should add to it. The notion that our industrial base can't find additional attackums is incorrect. We can, and we use the supplemental and the additional defense spending to uh, fill in whatever uh, we exhaust in terms of giving to Ukrainians. This is not a reason uh, to prevent the Ukrainians from winning. I'm looking at my clock here. I know I have eight seconds left. So I'm held to my five minutes. Let me just make two other points, which may take longer than eight seconds, so I apologize, but I'll do it quickly. We are seeing some strategic impact in this battle in the Black Sea. The fact that the Ukrainians now are able, we think, to restore the export of grain to pre-war levels is huge, not just their economy, but the psychological impact on Ukrainians. And that has been happening with killer drones that 100 plus companies from the West, including US companies, have helped the Ukrainians produce. Um, that is the sort of thing we need to see more of. We need to celebrate. It shows the ingenuity and entrepreneurship of the Ukrainian side. We need to talk about that more. Last, the American people are behind Ukraine winning. We've done surveys on this multiple times, most recently uh, towards the end of last year. The American people want to adopt a Reagan doctrine as it relates to Ukraine by giving them the security support so they can fight and win on their own. That is approaching a supermajority of Americans. Despite what Elon Musk says about his views of Ukraine not being able to win, the American people want Ukraine to win and they want the American people, the American people, excuse me, want the US government to support them in that fight by giving them this critical military support. Thank you for this opportunity. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Um, and I think we heard from General Lute, from Ambassador Lute, that Ukraine can win. Um, so I think that's an important thing to put stamp here as well. Um, Alina, uh, Alina Rybakova, who is the senior fellow uh, at the Peterson Institute for International Economics and we're gonna to pivot to economics. Thank you so much. Oops. Oh, maybe I'll, uh, I'll try again. Nope, I don't think Here. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. So, yeah. I'll be talking about economics, I'll be talking about sanctions, and my key message is sanctions work, we can do better. And uh, I think we have gotten lost in the debate that sanctions somehow are silver bullets and they're going to solve all the problems and, you know, we can solve foreign policy, national security, all problems just with sanctions. No, that's clearly not the case. At the same time, some people say, well, it's very confusing economic independence, economic statecraft. What is this sort of nebulous thing that we're talking about? I don't understand it. Should we just even be doing that? So I'll explain in very simple terms. We are supporting Ukraine, we're supporting Ukraine's independence at the moment, we're providing military and financial sector support. So shall we be giving cash to Russia at the same time? Probably not. Shall we have our companies sending uh, equipment, uh, sending components, chips to Russia? Again, probably not. So that's what sanctions are about, about not giving cash to Russia so we can send, uh, spend money more on the, on the war and also buy our Western main components for its military. It's very simple. It's not about some nebulous concepts. So what, uh, what have we done so far? We have done a lot, and I think we should definitely be very much supportive of our authorities, our powers that have invested so much and also multilateral coordination of the sanctions. But in many ways, we've also done a little bit of a drip of sanctions, just like we talk about military support. And let me just go over the things that we have done. We have done financial sector sanctions on Russia, but Russia has been preparing for those, just like China, by the way, since 2014. They have set up domestic alternatives to SWIFT, domestic payment systems. So when we did financial sector sanctions in February, we knew that we're squeezing out water from the stone. So we're trying to do the best we can. We were hoping for multiple equilibria where there will be a negative feedback loop between the economy and the real sector. It happened to an extent, but not fully. So we, there was some success. However, on the largest export of Russia, oil and gas, when did we take measures on those? We did them in 2023, almost a year after the beginning of the war. 
it, we're all living fortunately in democratic countries. It takes time. It is a process. It's wonderful that we all debate and we finally pass measures. But nonetheless, we should be also conscious that we can't be assessing the effect of energy sanctions for 2022 with, when there were none implemented yet. Right? So that is a big issue. Even then, compared to largest commodity exporters globally, Russia had a contraction. We can debate how much of a contraction, uh, according to Rostat, but nonetheless, there is a contraction in 2022. Most of other commodity exporters had double-digit growth or almost double-digit growth. You look at Saudi, you look at Indonesia, and many other countries. You had very strong growth in 2022. So it tells you something that something is still working. And then the third measure that we implemented are export controls. And it's a very innovative measure, and it's also a measure that we're using potentially against Chinese companies. But there is a concern here that we don't have enough infrastructure and corporate responsibility to do effective export controls. And that is very important because that might undermine the credibility of the U.S. sanctions infrastructure as such. You know, we started with the financial sector sanctions, we did some energy, some export controls, and we expect the same degree of overcompliance globally that we have with the financial sector sanctions to carry over into these new measures. They don't. You know, there is a lot of undercompliance. And Russia still gets access to critical components. And number one country helping Russia to do so is China. So if we think that we can target China with export controls, this is the time to do lessons learned and improve our infrastructure. This is, again, not because there are our colleagues at BIS and Department of Commerce and elsewhere are not doing a wonderful job. They are doing a wonderful job. But if we don't have infrastructure in the corporates to have their internal controls to comply with export controls, to have the data to provide to the authorities and match that data with the financial sector sanctions, of course, then an external person and a supervisor coming in will not be able to find anything because they have nothing to base their analysis on. It's a highly large, complex institutions um, that produce chips, for example. If they don't have internal controls, an external supervisor won't find what, they, what we need to find. So, and finally, I want to comment on the reserves of uh, Russian Federation. I think it was an extremely important measure that Russian Central Bank and the authorities did not expect. And I think you can see that clearly from the communication by the Central Bank at about the time it was announced. It was announced on the weekend. By Monday, I think it was, by Monday, the Central Bank came out and said, we were not going to intervene anymore. They intervened a lot, but they stopped intervening because this measure was taken. And they were forced to do capital controls. And as you probably heard from Putin many times, he was not a sort of a fan of uh, capital controls. And he also remembered the lessons of the 90s, where the fastest way out of the office is actually macroeconomic instability. So the reserves measure was a very important measure. But that measure is not sort of taking over Russian reserves. The ownership of reserves is not instead of providing support for Ukraine. It is also about accountability. And I've been talking to some historians, and they say Russia has never paid reparations, and in a way is proud to announce that. Frankly, I'm not a historian. I do not know for sure that's a fact. But it is important to have accountability for any country that wants to dominate and aggress and, uh, and military um, invade a neighbor, that there will be accountability. And so far, Russia is not showing any remorse or desire to, for rollback. So we need to be very clear that this is part of that accountability. But we need to be very transparent where the money is. In the US, in Europe, you know, we shouldn't be second guessing from indirect financial statements, whether it's Euroclear or some other company, how much is where. We need to say exactly, this is how much is in Europe, this is how much is in dollar, and we have good visibility. After all the reforms, Dodd-Frank Act and otherwise, in, we were passed here as well, and after 2008, we should have lots of clarity where the money is. And finally, the countermeasures. People mentioned the countermeasures. Uh, well, Russia has already started on the countermeasures. If you are, uh, we have revival of the concept of unfriendly nations. So if you're an investor from an unfriendly nation, starting from March, October 2022, you cannot take money out anymore. Starting from just a few months afterwards in January, your voting can be disregarded. State can take over your assets. And you basically, starting September 23, you have, they have suspended the shareholder rights. So the question is for the remaining companies operating in Russia, how can they operate without corruption in this kind of environment? So countermeasures have already started, and this is not an argument that uh, Russian or other supporters can use, saying that that's why we cannot take over reserves. So I'll stop here. Sanctions work. We can do better. Let's do it together. Thank you.
Let me Only just... because of the site right here. Right? <laughs> thank you. Well, I asked you guys to, to help me out. Um, thank you so much, Alina. And now we're going to turn to um, Evelyn Farkas, the executive director of the McCain Institute, to talk about um, you know, possibly politically isolating Russia. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador Yovanovitch, Masha. Thank you, Ambassador Herbst, John, um, Shelby Magid. Thank you to my colleague, Julia Ellings, who um, gave me all the updates on all of the people who were organized here today. I am honored to be included in this panel and in this um, day long, almost day-long um, activity. It's really important right now, at this moment in time, obviously, to shed light on or to draw attention to what's happening with regard to not just Ukraine, but Russia, to talk about containment. I also, um, when, I, when I saw the, the containment term and when John first mentioned it, I also thought to myself, but I would also like to roll back Russia, <laughs> roll back Russia from Ukraine, roll back Russia from Republic of Georgia, where they still occupy 20% of the territory, roll back Russia from Moldova, where they have a base in Transnistria, roll back Russia from Armenia, which the Armenian government is now trying to do as well, and we should acknowledge that. Um, so there is work to be done in the rollback category as well. With regard to containment, I'll try to be relatively brief. I think the most important thing that we can do diplomatically, politically, in terms of isolating Russia is, first of all, to shore up our alliances, to work with our allies in the transatlantic context, so our NATO allies, the European Union, and then to, do, to continue doing what we've seen the Biden administration doing, which is to draw our Asian allies also into the equation because our Asian allies now, especially Japan and South Korea, they understand very clearly that the implications of, of the, the fight, the war in Ukraine for them are serious, they're grave. China will be emboldened if Putin has his way. If Putin's aggressive foreign policy can prevail, then the danger to the Asian allies, um, starting of course first and foremost with Taiwan, but also Japan and other nations, Philippines, Vietnam, that have long-standing territorial and other disputes with China, those will continue. Um, there, there are a lot of, um, um, there's much more I could say about that, but I think the most important thing to start with is start with the allies, shore up those alliances. The European Union has declared that Russia is a uh, state sponsor of terrorism. We have not done that so far. Um, rather than advocate for that, because I'm not an attorney and I'm not well versed on the details, I do think we need to do more to stop Russia, more to allow our, our sanctions to be more effective, to look at the dual use um, components um, that Alina talked about as well that are coming from China and washing machines and other um, household appliances, not to mention, of course, the drones. Um, we then should move to the fence sitters. Those are countries like India, Indonesia, you know, long, long time non-aligned, if you will, if we're going back to the Cold War nations, but they still have that not the desire to be non-aligned in their DNA. For India, it's a lot harder now because China and Russia have this stated relationship now, this strategic partnership, and India is clearly in an adversarial relationship with China, um, ha having a, fighting hot skirmishes over border, unreserved border issues, and of course having a competition in and of itself. But uh, that does not make India a natural uh, ally of ours thus far. India is, has resisted on the issue of sanctions, is providing a lot of cash to Russia by buying fuel from Russia, and of course has provided diplomatic cover as well to Russia. So, and India having a lot of influence in parts of the global south, which is the next area that we have to focus on, um, is a country that we have to work to bring closer if we can, um, but understand that there may be limits um, to that. But again, all of this, the fact that these countries are fence sitters doesn't mean they have to stay fence sitters, and it doesn't mean that we can't use them to put more pressure on Russia while allowing them diplomatically to maintain a cover of sort of neutrality, if you will. Um, these, the countries like India and others, I think, could help us have a better narrative towards the global south. Um, we, it's been shocking to see what's happened on the African continent. I think most of us thought when Prigozhin was killed, when Prigozhin was removed from the scene, that maybe that would be an opening for us and our allies. It would be, you know, provide some hope for Africa. Instead, things have become worse. Um, Russia held a summit. Um, with the African nations, 
although, of course, Vladimir Putin was not able to travel to that summit physically, which is a good thing, <laughs> um, that he was still wary of what the South African government might do in terms of um, implementing the, the warrant for his arrest, which has come from the International Criminal Court. But nonetheless, they did hold that summit. Uh, we also know that in the coup in Niger, there were, there were um, flags that were flown, uh, Russian flags. We know that the Russian government is very active diplomatically and, of course, using all kinds of methodology in Africa to exert their influence. Our narrative has not gotten across. So the narrative, which when I, I, I last year I went and visited Finland, the then president, um, Ninsto, he understood very clearly that there was a narrative about colonialism and there was an argument, a story to be told. And he went as, as the leader of a country that had been occupied for 100 years by the Russian Empire and, and spoke with, he went to South Africa, he told me um, that the, the leadership um, listened to him um, and he was encouraged by that. And that emboldened him to go then to Brazil and to try to make the same argument. And that leads me also then to our backyard, the Western Hemisphere. It's another area where we need to work harder to get our narrative across, to isolate Russia diplomatically. I'm incredibly concerned by this aggressive move by Maduro um, to assert territorial um, prerogatives over Guyana. Um, this is just something right out of the Russian playbook. Those of us who have watched Russia, you know, in other parts of the world um, shouldn't be surprised, but I think we are surprised because uh, we see allies of Russia being emboldened to take this kind of action in our hemisphere. Um, it's, it's deeply concerning. And I think it gets to another point that I want to make, which is that we haven't done a good enough job um, frankly, keeping Putin um, off balance. There are things that we can do that are not military, that are diplomatic, um, like <laughs> welcoming Sweden and Finland into NATO, things like that that will surprise the Kremlin and cause the Kremlin to have to be distracted somewhere else. I mean, honestly, the, the, the horrendous situation right now in Gaza, that has come as a welcome, um, welcome distraction from the perspective of the Russian government and certainly Tehran in terms of the overall uh, effort that we need to place on dealing with Ukraine and defending Ukraine's sovereignty. The, it's a horrendous humanitarian and security situation in Gaza, but from the perspective of the Kremlin, it's very useful. It's been distracting us. And I, I, I am certain that w maybe the date wasn't coordinated among the Kremlin and um, and Tehran, the the Russians and the Iranians. Nevertheless, um, I I cannot but help think that there was some collusion there, um, and so we also need to think about how we can keep those bad actors, including of course Russia, off, um, knock them off balance. I, I also want to say um, we should also continue to double down on areas where um, the Ukrainians have had success. So I'm, I'm glad that. Roger mentioned uh, the Black Sea. Um, we know that just today um, there was another, the, the Ukrainians had an, attacked another Russian ship, a landing ship, I believe, that was taken out. A third of the Russian um, Black Sea fleet is now destroyed. The, the Ukrainians have managed, before this even, to reestablish freedom of navigation. It's not, it's not completely unimpeded, but it means that commerce is flowing. Um, and I think we need to continue to double down on efforts. Uh, General Lute mentioned the Kerch Strait Bridge. The, the Ukrainians can and should take this down. They just need more storm shadows. They need more equipment from us. So I think um, all of that is really important. And then the last point is don't forget the Arctic. You know, as the ice is melting and um, the climate is changing. The Russians and Chinese are looking to take advantage. The Russians have been conducting a military buildup since I was in the Pentagon in 2012 of the Arctic. They've only accelerated that. And now they're working with China to try to create sort of an Arctic um, polar, polar route, if you will. So um, I will leave it at that. There's much more that we can do to counter um, Russia and China, and including with our development assistance. But you guys wanted me to talk about diplomacy. So thank you. <laughs> and maybe that'll come up. Thank you.
Or yeah. just me? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really good at giving instructions, not, not so good at following them. Um, so thank you very much. Um, so thank you, Evelyn. And um, Gavin, if we could turn to you. Gavin Wild is, the senior, is a senior fellow uh, in the Tech and International Affairs Program at Carnegie um, to talk about something that I think is probably near and dear to all of us, uh, cyber attacks and disinformation. Yeah, so uh, likewise, I'm very uh, humbled and grateful to be here with this esteemed uh, group and among such uh, stellar colleagues. Um, I was trying to think about how to link resilience and uh, containment together, and I thought back to 2016 in the midst of everything that was happening, and uh, as we were working, uh, the IC at the time was working on the assessment of what of Russian interference in the elections that year, at the time, one of our deepest concerns uh, was that Russia had this very well-developed, holistic, self-reinforcing vision of the power of information and cyber warfare that the United States neither quite understood nor quite knew how to deal with. Uh, over the ensuing years, I think, uh, and especially in the past two in Ukraine, uh, my greatest concern now is less that we don't understand Moscow's approach, uh, more that we accept its premise at face value, uh, that being that the gradual accumulation of disruption somehow inevitably works to Moscow's strategic advantage, and that its targets remain themselves helpless and unlearning. But Ukraine's lesson for us is that every bit of fear and focus on whether or not Russia is capable of shutting off the lights plays right into Moscow's designs and distracts from the harder conversations of how quickly and efficiently we are at turning them back on again. Uh, indeed, for many years now, Moscow has envisioned information warfare, quote unquote, as an indigenous, as an ingenious mixture, rather, of mind control and technological sophistication that can not only bend battlefields to its favor, but more importantly, entire populations to its whim. But for the past decade, at least, Moscow's put these theories to the test in Ukraine, only to find its victims becoming more resilient, more adaptive, and better resourced. With support from allies and partners and civil society, Ukraine's digital resolve is a stark reminder to both Russia and its would-be victims in cyberspace that the plurality of disruption is not necessarily decisive. Far from being complementary to its broader geopolitical objectives to subordinate its neighbor, Russia's information war, which has largely been focused on civilian targets, mind you, has arguably proven counterproductive their faith in Ukrainian leadership and institutions is only strengthened. Ukraine's on track to make digital innovation a cornerstone of its economy and electronic governance a cornerstone of its future democracy. Meanwhile, Western technology and cybersecurity firms in rushing to Ukraine's aid now have arguably the best visibility into Russia's evolving cyber threats as they ever have, likely enabling them to preempt and prevent catastrophic attacks against industrial control systems, energy grids, and the like further in advance. Now, there are historical echoes of Ukraine's experience in cyberspace. This coming June will mark 80 years since Germany launched a salvo of what was essentially the world's first ever cruise missile, the infamous V-1 buzz bomb. It was a technologically ingenious device, taking the pilot out of the equation altogether. After three years of pummeling London with air raids, and terrorizing its citizens in an effort to break Britain's resolve, Berlin was banking on the V1 to be decisive. However, as it would soon find out, scores of allied engineers over that same period had tapped into Britain's urgency and resolve to spur some ingenuity of their own. From July through August of 1944, the world's first microwave radar-enabled air defense system took down the vast majority of the hundreds of V1s that Germany volleyed across the channel. Despite all of its ingenious design choices, the Achilles heel of the V1 missile was this, its predictability. It was small, it flew fast, and it flew, it flew low, yes, but it also flew straight and it flew level. There was no pilot to take evasive action or consider alternate paths to reach its goal. Like Russian information warfare later, all of its technological sophistication notwithstanding, it was still a blunt instrument in service of an ultimately flawed strategy. 
Ukrainian resilience in the information domain is a reminder that the best offense truly can be a good defense, and that particularly in response to the Russian cyber threat, the best revenge very well might be living well. Moscow's doctrines bank on anxiety. They do not factor for adaptivity and resolve. None of this means, of course, that we can rest easy. Russian state-backed, state-adjacent, and state-harbored cyber actors are gonna continue posing acute threats to national security. They will remain skilled at espionage, subversion, and disruption, and they will continue seeking ways to preposition against the eventualities of armed conflict. Even our best efforts at prevention, disruption, punishment, and prosecution are likely to be insufficient to alter these interests and incentives for the foreseeable future. But we too have become more resilient. Our national conversations and strategies about cyber have gradually shifted from the fear, uncertainty, and doubt fueled by ever-present threats towards necessary conversations about how we allocate trust in networks, how we assign responsibility to the most capable for security in software design and componentry supply chains, and how quickly and effectively we reconstitute in the event of inevitable breaches. In other words, we've begun to think harder about how to contain the Russian cyber threat by adapting to it and mitigating its worst effects. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And um, to uh, uh, sort of back clean up here, um, Luke Coffey, who's a senior fellow at, H at Hudson Institute, to talk about the broader implications um, of containing Russia. And I know he's going to remember to turn on his microphone. Yeah, the pressure's on. I kept thinking, <laughs> I have to remember this, otherwise I'm going to look like a fool up here. Uh, I'll be put in my place, uh, rightfully so. Anyway, uh, thank you, Ambassador, for the introduction. John, thank you and your wonderful team for putting together this event and getting us, uh, you know, corralling all of us together all the other think tank uh, contributors. Um, it's an honor to be a part of this. To uh, talk about um, how what happens in Ukraine impacts also our uh, engagement and our competition and our uh, uh, containment or deterrence, however you want to call it, with China and Iran is first best understood when you look at the world we're in today as being one that's multipolar. A lot of my colleagues hate this term. It's not multipolar. We're still the lone superpower. While this might be the case, uh, it is also true that there are uh, increasingly growing centers of power around the world that are all using s all powers of state, whether it's sec security, military, diplomatic, economic, trade, whatever, to advance their national interests. And all, I would even go so far as saying that if you took a diplomat from 1880 and a diplomat from 1980, and you had both cryogenically frozen, and then you brought both of them back to life today, it would be the diplomat from 1880 that would best recognize the world we're in. It's not the bipolarity of the, of the Cold War era. I think we're slowly transitioning out of that, and it's more of a multipolar world during an era of you know, what was great power competition. The only difference being, um, because of advancements in technology, as you just heard from, from Gavin, uh, Gavin, right? Yeah, did I get his name correct here? Yeah, okay. <laughs> we just met today, so I'm allowed to. Um, because of advancements in technology, you now have non-state actors that can behave like states or at least have the same impact as states. Think uh, so-called Islamic State, think Al-Qaeda, think Hezbollah. You know, these groups uh, have forced us to behave as if they are states. So in this multipolar structure, you have this deadly cocktail of state and non-state actors that we have to be aware of. And that's why what happens in Ukraine matters to what's going on with China and Taiwan and also Iran. The Russians understand this. They get this right. When the Russians go to their, their uh, Syrian poker table... They bring their chips from their Ukraine poker table, from their Arctic poker table. They see all these issues as being interconnected. Mm -hmm. Whereas we in the West, we still kind of view this, these issues as being stovepiped. When we go to the Ukraine poker table, we might bring the NATO chips, but we're usually just focused on just the issue at hand, Ukraine. And this requires a fundamental 
uh, shift in how we think. Now, on the two specific issues of China and Iran, it is clear to me how they are linked to what is happening in Ukraine. I, China is such an obvious example. I find it hard to believe that the people around Washington, D.C., who are trying to tell us that what happens in Ukraine has nothing to do with China's decision on what to do with Taiwan, I, I cannot believe that they actually believe this themselves. It seems so obvious to me. Um, the uh, leaders in East Asia say this. It's no coincidence that the same week that President Xi visited Moscow last year, Prime Minister Kashida was in Kyiv. Um, Russia and China are partners uh, on the global stage. Anything done to weaken Russia will indirectly weaken China. And of course, China is watching how we respond with our support to Ukraine because it has its eye on Taiwan and it's gonna you know, use this as a way to gauge our national resolve, resolve and commitment. So these issues are, the, the, the security of East Asia and Eastern Europe, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many leaders in East Asia, are intimately linked. On Iran, the longer the war lasts in Ukraine, the more advantageous this is for Iran. Iran is getting uh, hard cash from the Russians for a lot of the drone supplies. Uh, the U Ukrainian uh, conflict is being used as a proving ground for these uh, Iranian weapon systems. We've already seen advancements through open source intelligence of the evolution of the Shahid uh, baseline variant, uh, whether it's uh, now with some with a jet engine, uh, some with uh, certain um, you know, um, uh, coverings, the radar evasive coverings and materials being used to manufacture. The Iranians are learning uh, what, what is happening. And we also have to see how the, you know, the, the region between Iran and Russia is linked to what's happening in Ukraine. And by this, I mean the, the Caspian. The Caspian Sea is used by Iran to evade sanctions. This is nothing new. It's been doing this for a long time. The Caspian is also the lifeline that allows Iran to transport many of these goods to the Russian Federation. Uh, Iran is investing in inf infrastructure in this region, including dredging of the, of the Volga River, um, the Volga Don Canal that allows uh, maritime transport between the Caspian Sea and the Sea of Azov is a, is a strategic priority for Russia. And in the, in, in the non-winter months, it is used all the time to, to move not only um, uh, goods and supplies along this route, but also the ships of the Caspian Flotilla can go back and forth between the Caspian and the Sea of Azov and on into the Black Sea. And the Caspian Sea is used by Russia as a way to launch uh, sea-based uh, cruise missiles to um, attack locations in Ukraine in a way that uh, gives them a certain uh, safe distance from the, the actual fighting. So it's a, it's a comfortable area for to Russia for Russia to use when it uh, launches its attacks against Ukraine. And I would even say that in some ways our policymakers, certainly in NATO, need to see, need to start seeing NATO's Black Sea frontier as being the southern shore of the Caspian Sea. And we have to see better see how these things are, are interconnected. I'll conclude by saying that in order to pursue any policy of containment or rollback or whatever, we have to first show U.S. resolve, U.S. leadership, and restore America's prestige. Let's not forget that on February 24th, 2022, when Russia conducted its large-scale invasion of Ukraine, just six months before, just six months, the world was watching Afghans falling off the wheel wells of C-17s as we were beating a retreat from Kabul. America's prestige and honor was disgraced. Our adversaries thought we can test America in a way otherwise not possible, and our partners and our allies were questioning our resolve. If we didn't get it right in the early days of, uh, of, of 2022, it's likely that this panel discussion here today would be about China and Taiwan. But luckily we did get it right, but now we need to take it to the next step, and as uh, Ambassador Liu said, give the Ukrainians weapons they need to win and not just to survive. Thank you. Thank you, super interesting. And I, I um I'm going to open it up for, for general questions, but I do want to ask one question of uh, Steve Sestanovich, which is in this context of uh, American prestige, um, as well as the need to um, contain Russia, what, what about the question of Ukraine's possible membership in NATO? 
And so if I could ask you to yeah. be quick on yeah. the answer. So I think this is really important. Thank you and apologies. I, I think the, uh, having some thoughts about uh, Ukraine's NATO membership is going to be very important because it's going to be front and center in the Washington summit uh, this summer. Uh, that is going to be, it's going to be one of the key definitions or tests of the success of that summit, which is after all, let us remember the 75th anniversary uh, of NATO. Um, there are lots of different opinions on this, and I think it's highly unlikely that there will be a consensus within the alliance on membership for Ukraine, uh, which makes it all the more important to think about uh, what to do if, you, if there's not that consensus. Um, the crucial requirement here, as important as membership itself, is seeing Ukraine's security as inseparable from our own. And I think there was a strong consensus developing about that before the Vilnius summit last year. But I think the focus on that question has been lost a little bit. Um, we should remember how important that idea is, that Ukraine's uh, security is inseparable from our own, because it's the basis for all the cooperation that is necessary uh, as a kind of complement substitute for a membership if it doesn't materialize. As I say, I think that consensus has weakened and uh, that means there's a lot of work to be done between now and, uh, and the summit. Um, a lot of that work you can be sure is going on in memos within the administration but if we've got any congressional staffers here, it's something that the uh, administration's mind will focus on more strongly if they hear uh, pressure from the Congress, if they feel pressure from the Congress to address this question in the right way. I think, thank you. That was a, a really super important point. So I'm gonna open it up to questions from the audience. Um, we've got about um, nine minutes. This is the lull before lunch, I guess. So I will, um, I will ask a question then, and you guys be thinking about what you might want to ask. Um, Alina, I'd like to ask you about you know the three hundred billion dollars um, in uh, frozen Russian assets that is um, held around the world, and what more do we need to be doing? I mean, we've seen the House and the Senate both you know move forward on bills. Where does it stand now? What do we need to 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 do to get that going? I think first we need to have absolute clarity how much is held in dollars and where. That would be just for accountability, for our own accountability. And then I think we do need to work with our European partners in terms of understanding what kind of legal, and I'm not a lawyer, I'm an economist, but what kind of legal concerns they have so we can work together with them. And uh, concerns that they have on the financial sector, on the diversification away from uh, dollar or euro. So, or, or Swiss franc, or <laughs> Canadian dollars, you know? So there is a, this argument that this will undermine dollar dominance of the global financial system. Um, there are risks, but there is also should be an understanding, and I think actually somebody came to PBOC, to, um, to Peterson, and this question was asked, and, but there is an, and they said, look, if country doesn't comply with global international security standards, so why should they enjoy the benefits? And I think actually there is, it's on record that somebody from PBOC, senior person from PBOC making that comment at Peterson. So that is a very important argument. And also there are no alternatives. Look at Russia before this war, before February 22nd. There was some diversification, but where to? You know, Russian Central Bank um, invested a bit in dollars, uh, in, in um, gold, 20%, because they produce gold, so they could buy that. They grudgingly invested some in Yuan. They also tried to do it not in mainland China, they tried to do it in Hong Kong, because they really did not like that idea. And then where else are they gonna go to? Um, so I think it's about enjoying the benefits when you don't comply with the rules and also not having an alternative. Uh, I could add more. I think there's wonderful work by Barry Eichengring when the shift happened between the pound and the dollar. One of the drawing important factors was the institutions, the reliability and institutions in the US. So I think, again, why there's no alternatives? Because there are no institutions like we have in the US and in Europe 
to provide that security for the investors. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I have a question for um, both Evelyn and for uh, Roger, uh, and that is, uh, what, what if we fail on Ukraine? What if, what if Ukraine loses? Um, which is not, you know, a prospect I want to um, put out there. But what does that, what are the greater um, effects for the West's ab ability to effectively contain Russia? Can we do it if, if Ukraine um, fails? Do you want ladies first? Go ahead. <laughs> um, I think, look, it's clear that if, if we fail to stop Putin's aggressive foreign policy, he will take control not just of Ukraine, but of Georgia, Moldova, reassert control over Armenia. He will then turn to NATO. He will challenge NATO. He will try to demonstrate that Article 5 doesn't exist mm -hmm. um, and, and therefore weaken or destroy NATO. He will come after the United States even more aggressively. We know that the Russian government is attacking us through cyber, through social media, through corrupt means, through economic pressure across the board. And so uh, if Putin is not stopped, if his aggressive foreign policy is not stopped, he will continue to weaken our democracy, to corrupt our democracy, to essentially work with, frankly, people in America who are right now mouthing the, the, the very things that the Kremlin says, you know, Russia's going to win anyway, so why provide assistance to Ukraine? I mean, that is a Kremlin talking point that we are hearing in the halls of our very own Congress, not in this chamber, I believe, but maybe in this chamber, actually. Yeah, come to think of it, yes, it was in this chamber. So, I mean, this is shocking right now, but we know from our history, if you just go back to the 30s and 40s, when we were fighting fascism, in Germany, um, or fascism in Europe, rather, we were also fighting it at home, and we had members of our Congress who were mouthing, you know, kind of Hitler, pro-Hitler statements, um, trying to pull America into a kind of quasi-isolationist um, uh, stance, not really isolationist because, of course, it was benefiting um, Hitler, and in this case, to, to try to call for isolationism is naive or co collaboration with our adversaries. So I, I, I talked too long, and I should turn it over to Roger, but I, I think it's a, it's a very grave situation if uh, Putin and his foreign policy is not defeated. Quick addition here. Uh, one, we are failing. I think we just need to realize that. Ukraine is not, but the United States is, and that failure is playing out uh, principally right now here in the U.S. Congress, but as uh, referenced earlier, the uh, administration policy, because it has not been fully committed uh, to winning in terms of its security assistance primarily, but also making the case to the American people. Uh, so let's just recognize where we're at. Um, and zooming out a little bit, something we, we didn't hit on in this conversation, but it's absolutely critical to this point in terms of uh, stalemate and, and where Russia is and U.S. support uh, right around the moment where Russia invaded Ukraine, the Biden administration was set to release its national security strategy and national defense strategy. Then it held a little bit because it realized it needed to make an adjustment for this war in Europe. Um, but over the past two years, we've seen the outcome and the impact both uh, in Europe, but as Luke outlined, geopolitically across the world. The strategy has not caught up. So we're fighting this battle with a strategy that predates mm -hmm. Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And that, in many respects, reflects uh, why we're not succeeding here in the United States. And I think uh, the national security strategy, national defense strategy in particular, uh, requires a significant uh, change. And I would argue that we can't look at Russia as just an acute threat, but as uh, my colleague, uh, under sec former Undersecretary Eric Edelman, called, uh, refers to it, it's a chronic threat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if I could um, turn to Gavin and ask you, uh, you know, kind of a politically loaded question. So can you talk uh, about our upcoming, um, you know, season of elections? We just had one last night. There are many more coming up, culminating, of course, with our presidential elections in November. Uh, what Russia is, is uh, doing in, in the area of um, cyber attacks, but, but also, crucially, disinformation. And how are we combating that? Because this is, 
This is about our uh, internal political discussions. Yeah, no, I think it's safe to operate on the assumption that uh, Russia is going to be try to be disruptive technologically and certainly um, in the narrative environment. But I think a lot of that focus of on the threat is like as I said in my comments, we need to direct a lot more of that energy to addressing the homegrown. Um, issues, understanding why some of these narratives are taking root in the first place. I think we've been distracted by the technological means of, of uh, transmitting Russian disinformation narratives, but less uh, capable of kind of understanding why they may take root and that it's not simply kind of a, a technocentric, um, it's not something we can tweak out with algorithmic changes. It's not something we can necessarily um, uh, guard against through, you know, pre-bunking or debunking, helpful as those things may be, uh, but there's a lot of uh, discussion we need to have about trust in institutions, trust among uh, citizens, trust and, and, uh, and media, uh, media literacy uh, among the U.S. public. Those are harder conversations. And I think uh, too often we get caught up with the, the technological fixes that we'd like to make, but they don't quite uh, get at the underlying causes of why Russia sees disinformation as a valuable tool to use against the United States, its propaganda efforts. Um, and so I think those conversations have become a lot more robust. But all that said, I think, you know, Meta just put out a great report yesterday. Um, Department of Justice just undertook a really um, bold effort against uh, Chinese threat actors in cyberspace. I think we're getting a lot better at um, enabling those with power to act and with power to do something um, at a systemic level, um, getting them to uh, keep doing it, especially when it comes to elections, is, is a difficult challenge. Thank you very much. So I think, Luke, you've been saved by the, <laughs> by the timer, <laughs> unless you want to have the last word. No, I, I'm mindful of lunch just over there, so yeah. I think I'll. <laughs> I to be when you're between lunch and um, a, a hungry audience. Um, so I'd just like to close by thanking um, the panelists for a really interesting discussion and for thanking um, Ambassador Herbst and the Atlantic Council and you know the many other organizations that have sponsored uh, this event today. I think, I, I hope this is the first of, of many such conversations because as, as pretty much everybody on this panel has touched on, we need to be thinking hard about the future and what we need to do to be ahead of the curve rather than um, behind the curve. So thank you very much. This will only take one minute. I'd like to thank um, our moderator for a wonderful job. She had a tougher job than me. She had to ask all the questions herself. I'd like to thank you all for coming. This is the start of something which will continue. We're going to talk about the need to address this Kremlin danger, albeit as part of a danger which includes, in the long term, a more dangerous China. And we may wind up in some fashion taking this show on the road. Uh, this is a conversation that needs to be held first and foremost here but also in key capitals in Europe and maybe beyond Europe. Thank you all.